Well, hello everybody, this is Tim Green with Rattle Magazine. Welcome to Rattlecast number 224. Thanks so much for joining me. Today's guest, Gaten Scrone, is here. Well, he'll be joining us in just a minute. Before we begin, I should say that Rattle's a publication of the Rattle Foundation, a 501c3 nonprofit working to promote the practice of poetry. Uh, we've been a continuous publication since 1995 and are unaffiliated with any other organization. We just do this because we love poetry and know you do too. So please do click the like button and share. Make sure you subscribe, ring the bell, leave reviews on iTunes or Spotify if you're watching and listening after the fact. Um, anything you can do to help spread poetry around the internet would be much appreciated. Now, as always, we're going to start with our prop poem or our poetry spawn poem of the week. And uh, this week's poet is a second appearance um, by Lisa Majaj in Poetry Respond uh, in the last several months. I think about four months ago, she had a poem as well. And this poem was about the uh, the war going on in Gaza right now, of course, uh, which so many of the poems are that are being submitted for Poetry Respond. And um, this was about a tragic loss of a poet's life. And so I'll read uh, Lisa's note right here first, and then, um, and then we'll share the poem. Uh, here it is. And Lisa says... Uh, on December 7th, Gazan writer Rafait al was killed, along with family members in a targeted Israeli airstrike. Rafait was a professor of literature, a poet, and a writer beloved inside and outside of Gaza for his words and for his role in the nonprofit organization We Are Not Numbers, a youth-led project seeking to tell the stories of Gazans. Scores of Gazan poets, writers, artists, musicians, and journalists have been killed in the past months. In the recording made before his killing, Rafate said, choked with tears, the situation is very bleak. We don't even have water. Days before his death, Rafate pinned this poem to his Twitter account, in which um, you can go read if you want by going to the, the poem and then uh, his Twitter account. But some of the lines are quoted too by Lisa here. So once again, this is Sunday's poem, um, Lisa Suher Majaj with Shroud of Light. Why don't you give it a listen? Shroud of Light. If I must die, you must live to tell my story, Rafat al -Adir. By the time they killed Rafat, there was nothing new about the rows of bodies rolled up in stark white shrouds, surprisingly unbesmirched by dust or blood, tied at both ends in neat bundles, sometimes in the middle too, so the sheet wouldn't slip carried gently through streets on the way to mass graves, those pits dug in whatever ground could be reached without the living being picked off by snipers, the unstained white of winding claws belying the odor of carnage, permeating every crevice, miasma of death hanging like an ashen pall in the sky, clogging the lungs of those who still try to breathe. A newscaster said, children are meant to play in the dirt, but in Gaza, it's their shroud. Even that is beyond many. One Gazan wrote, If I die, please make sure my children's bodies are covered, not left open to wild dogs, the relentless howling sky. Lost beneath rubble, Rafat was denied a poet's burial, left only stone dust and concrete for his shroud. But the words that survive his death wrap his living spirit in a gauze of light. There's a Palestine that dwells inside all of us, he wrote. Take his words, inscribe them on a kite, brilliant white, to fly high over the terrible world, so that his death is a tale that brings hope, so that he lives, so that we live, so that Gaza becomes a place not of shrouds, but of freedom, kites rippling in sunshine, lit by the blaze of life. And once again, that was Lisa Suher Majaj with Shroud of Light. Uh, Lisa lives in Cyprus, and so it's about 3 a.m. there where she is. Uh, she said maybe she could try to join if she woke up in the middle of the night, but um, thankfully she hasn't. But uh, glad to have her voice there on the Rattlecast sharing that important and, and powerful poem. Uh, now we're going to take a quick break and go to tonight's main guest. So sit tight, and I'll be right back with more poetry. <laughs>
And we're back. Now, like I said, today's guest is Gaetan Scro. Um, he's an internal medicine doctor, girl dad, and medical educator at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine, where he co-directs a program in the humanities, uh, medical humanities. He's the recipient of teaching awards, including the Leonard Tao Humanism and Medicine Award, the Golden Apple Teaching Award, and the Carl R. Furman Clinical Educator of the Year Award. His writings appeared in Rattle, the most recent issue, or I guess the fall issue, uh, the Bellevue Literary Review, Hippocampus Magazine, and others, including things like the Annals of Internal Medicine, JAMA, and the Best New Poets Anthology. Uh, you can find more on his website, um, Gaten Scro. And here he is. Uh, Gaten, how you doing? I'm doing great, Tim. This is a thrill to be here. Yeah, it's a thrill to have you. I've had, um, I think, about two or three years ago. I can't remember how long that article that you published um, about using poetry as part of your medical practice. Um, somebody saw that and said, hey, Tim, you got to read this article. And in the back of my mind, I thought, oh, we have to get get you on the Rattlecast or or talk to you somehow. And it's really a pleasure to talk to you now after reading that, too, and, and rereading it just now. It's really wonderful what you've been doing with poetry. Yeah, well, well thank you. Um, it's funny. I, I, um, I think of these disciplines medicine poetry somewhat in silos and that article came out in a medical journal academic medicine and so it's uh it's wonderful that you were able to come across it yeah well there there are i mean of course famously you know certain will and carlos williams among others were physicians and poets too but there aren't that many poets that are doctors as well so it's really neat to have somebody you know doing things that you would think is compartmentalized and different, like different parts of the brain, and yet they come together so well and in such important ways. Uh, your, your first poem that you had to share was um, A Physician's Grammar. Do you want to start with that? Sure, I'd love to. A Physician's Grammar. The young woman in the brilliant red wrap who clings to her daughter in the glow of the star lamp has not failed her treatment. The young man who's traded his bright eyes his best suit, all the damn fools who love him for a fistful of oxies is not abusing them. It's not that the whiskered gentleman who stares past the curtain in 127, having lost all interest in taking your medicine, is a difficult patient. It is pain, once again, upsetting syntax, confusing agents, sharpening our own disappointment. After all, no one blames the surf for the tide's retreat or chides the wind-whipped oak for letting go its leaves. Yeah, beautiful poem. That was um, A Physician's Grammar by Gaten Scro. And, uh, and so can you tell us about how you came to be doing both things? Um, you know, it, it's the, it seems like one had to come first, maybe. Was there something that you, you fell in love with first? How did you get into being both into poetry and medicine? Oh, I mean, I, I consider myself having come to medicine very late. Uh, you know, I, Billy Collins says that we're all born with about a thousand bad poems in us. <laughs> and I started getting those out, um, at least in high school, you know, we're writing for the literary magazine and and scribbling poems uh, through college, you know, as I uh, pursued an English degree without really any clear plans as to what I would do with it. Um, you know, I think I was I always had the idea of being a writer in the back of my mind, but I knew I was kind of lacking experience. And uh, so in a way, you know, going into medicine um, was, was a way of gaining that kind of real world experience. Mm -hmm. well, that's interesting. And I, and I heard, um, you know, in that article, you mentioned um, coming across a poetry reading by a doctor, um, you know, that, that lasted two hours, which was something that was uh, pretty impressive <laughs> and unusual, too. Um, can you tell us about how, how you came across that and, and how that influenced you as a, as a doctor? Yeah, absolutely. So th this was a time in my life when, so as soon as I got into medical school, which wasn't easy for an English major with, with mediocre grades uh, at that um, I, I decided that, you know, I had to shut down this side of, of me, at least not let it out of the closet. And so um, I was actually a pretty miserable medical student. I was very focused on passing the basic science classes, which is what you do for the first two years is um, uh, sit in the classroom mostly. And uh, it was it was one day I just came across a flyer for this poetry reading. And it, it did say that it was Dr. John Stone who was going to do the reading. and That's what intrigued me. Um, and I just remember going and um, I, you know, I was kind of disappointed by the turnout, as I'm sure he was. But it was in a really neat space in, in Philadelphia at the American College of Physicians. There is a, a museum of medical artifacts. And it's, it's one of these places with kind of the red velvet carpeting and the tall case, glass cases. 
Um, and we just sat in a circle as he read. Um, and that was really my first inkling that, you know, maybe these two interests of mine could uh, could be compatible. Mm hmm. And then and did you I mean, how much writing of poetry were you doing at that time? Was it something that you would just sort of did regularly still or was it something you dropped and and forgot about and then and then picked up again? How how regular is your your poets process? Oh, well, back then it was it was, you know, I didn't write a lot of poetry in medical school. I wrote a lot of emails to my family, which was kind of a form of journaling. And, and actually that continued through residency, which is the the part of the sort of the apprenticeship once you become a doctor, but you're not allowed to practice on your own. Um, so a lot of, a lot of just journaling kind of things. And I really didn't start taking poetry more seriously until um, I got to be a chief resident, um, which is sort of a year of administration after this really grueling residency experience. And I had some time to sit back and reflect. And I, I just decided, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to try to take a poetry workshop. Um, and I, I had the audacity to send some poems to um, one of the professors in the writing program at Pitt. Um, and I, I didn't know who Toy Derricotte was, which is crazy. Um, mm -hmm. I'm glad I didn't, because I probably wouldn't have sent her what I did. Um, but she, she basically let me into her class, which turned out to be her final uh, writing seminar. Uh, in po It was a generative poetry workshop. Um, and I think she let me in because you know, her students were also interested in my perspective, having just gone through residency and medical training. And um, I think she thought I could bring some of uh, some good stories, at least to class. Yeah, I think that's a good insight. I've talked to, to professors who sort of lament that, you know, that their students sort of fresh from undergrad programs that don't have anything, you know, perspectives to talk about. And, and so I'm sure you added a lot to the class just by um, being, you know, in some other profession. It's really fascinating, and Toy is wonderful too. We interviewed her in issue number thirty-one. Just one of the one of the friendliest, funnest, uh, oh, great poet. Yeah, she's wonderful. Really she, lucky to have a class. Such with her. a generous, generous person, and I think that's the the fact that she took me seriously is is what made me start to take myself seriously. Mm -hmm. Well, let's hear another poem. Um, looks we have a prose poem. Are the reasons for admission? Sure. Um, I will just preface this by saying that it references something called ICD-10, which uh, I hope that lay people do not know about. Um, I wish I didn't know about it. It is a, it's a, a taxonomy. It's a system of uh, it's attaching diagnostic codes to our notes um, in order to basically bill for, mm -hmm. for healthcare. And uh, it, it contains 70,000 diagnostic codes which is supposedly everything, you know, it's supposed to capture all the elements of human um, illness, at least, if not experience. How many, um, 7,000 so, uh, or 70,000? 70, 70,000. 70, 70,000, wow. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, like any anything that purports to capture everything, it, uh, you know, sort of immediately falls mm -hmm. short. So this is reasons for admission not indexed in ICD-10. The need to catch up on sleep an ache to sleep on clean sheets, the prospect of waking up dry, to sleep without fear of being robbed or kicked in the night, having just gotten insurance, never having had insurance, thinking it might be cancer, thinking you'll deal with it later, thinking it's one thing and finding out it's another, doing it for your partner, doing it to get back at your partner, being sick and tired of lying, of working in that kitchen, owing it to your children, something you saw on television, because somebody was too busy typing. You can't remember ever laughing, because you are terrified of dying alone, because you are terrified of living alone, because you are terrified of him, because you blacked out and your friends dragged you in. Because nobody speaks your language. Because your wife left with the kids. Left you with the kids. Got herself admitted. Because of the voices. Because of the Earth's movements. Something the moon did. The bus strike. The election. Fleeing persecution. Because of a broken system. A positive review of systems because you lost a bet, because you found religion, the promise of life-changing medicine, 
broken promises, because you needed a lift, because like everyone else, you wish. Yeah, it's a great prose poem. That was um, Reasons for Admission Not Indexed in the ICD-10, which I had not heard of, thankfully, the ICD-10. Um, so, so, you know, once you became a doctor and you started introducing poetry in your practice a little bit, which was, in, in reading that article, I, I was expecting it to be another article, which there are a good number of about, you know, poetry is healing and, and that sort of art therapy type stuff. And it actually, you use it in your practice teaching other doctors and, um, and doing rounds and, and, you know, as part of that, that practice, which is a really, that's one of the most fascinating things I've, I've heard because it's not the typical, um, you know, use of poetry in the kind of healing process. And we don't really think of doctors, you think of the doctors as this like sort of almost like robotic, like fix me doc kind of thing <laughs> and not as human beings and the difficulty of dealing with so much tragedy and, and trauma and everything you go through on a day-to-day -day basis. I mean, I, on a very, very small like level of that, I was a counselor at a group home for mentally ill adults. And so, and there was so much burnout among the staff just because you'd see, you know, people like making strides and succeeding and then falling back and, you know, and decompensating. And it was just really heartbreaking to see the people struggle and fail and then go off on the streets. And then, you know, and so people, you know, the average sort of time working, people couldn't handle it a lot of the time because of the emotional stress of trying to work with that. And as a doctor in medicine, you know, especially at a hospital, you know, working at that degree must be orders of magnitude more stressful than that. But we never think of doctors as like human beings that have to deal with that stress. So can you tell us about how you integrated and why you thought to integrate poetry into your practice in that way? Yeah. Um, well, yeah. F credit to Danielle Offrey, who is the editor of the Bellevue Literary Review. She's the first doctor to write about using poetry in this way. Um, I think... I've become a very consistent practitioner in that I use it almost every day. And I'll, I'll just explain a bit of the day to day. I'm, I'm a hospitalist. Um, so I take care of, of, of veterans in the hospital and I do so with a team of residents. So usually three doctors in training and usually and a couple medical students as well. Um, and we do a lot of work in the morning to take care of the patients and bleeds in the afternoon. They can be working all day if I don't interrupt them at some point and say, listen, we're about to spend our hour doing dedicated teaching. Um, and, and a lot of us will do a lecture on pathophysiology in that time. And that's kind of how I started out too. Um, but, you know, uh, eventually I started working the poems in and I, I used to do it every fourth day and now I don't do it almost every day. Um, and it's just a really nice opportunity um, for them to, you know, kind of sit back and reflect. And I always tell them, you know, this is not, a class where you have to interpret the poem for me or fill out a blue book. Um, if you just want to sit there and listen, that's perfectly fine. Um, but they almost always speak up and join in. And, and that's the neat thing. That's, I tried to capture all the ways I think this is working in that article, but I think on the basic level, it's just giving that space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, do you, what is the, the reaction among people um, that you do this to? Because, you know, if you talk to somebody about poetry, like on a plane next to you or something, they start to look at you like you have two heads or something. So in, in, it's just a poetry is wonderful, but the world, the general public doesn't realize the value and the, the importance of it. So, so what is the reaction to these sort of serious, you know, med students and doctors who are then you're reading them, you know, Will and Carlos Williams or something? Yeah. Well, I mean, you hit the nail on the head in terms of my apprehension in doing this is I, I have started to believe, you know, after almost 10 years um, that I'm going to have positive reactions. But in the beginning, you know, I would I would be sitting there and, and some of these people have MDs and PhDs and they're really heavy in the sciences. And so I expected a skeptical audience and I almost have I, I cannot think of an example of somebody you know, saying, hey, this is not for me, I'm out of here. Um, everyone at least respects the experience. And so many people are surprised, I think, uh, by their own reaction to it. Hmm. And, and what, so, uh, what, what kind of poems do you share with them? Um, are there certain ones that sort of have the most resonance? Are you trying to find things that are about, about being a doctor? Or, you know, what are you going for when you share those poems? I'm going, I'm honestly going for resonance, Tim, and, 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 and connection. And so I don't care whether it's a poem that is thematically related to the work that we're doing. And in fact, I read, I have a folder of, you know, like 300 poems now. 
very few of them are written by doctors. Very few of them are related to medicine, um, even from a patient's perspective. Um, you know, many of them are just poems that I know work in terms of are they're easy to connect to. Um, and I, you know, I read a lot of rattle poems um, because a lot of rattle poems start off in a place that is inviting. Um, you know, they may take you somewhere unexpected, often do. Um, but but I'm, I'm drawn to um, poems that, that can draw you know, really anyone in. Mm -hmm. And do you find, um, you know, free verse, you know, versus, you know, metered and rhyme poetry? Is there a difference there and, you know, what people land on? One of the things you hear is that, you know, it's not poetry unless it rhymes. So what are you talking about? And, oh, um, <laughs> yeah. No, sure. I, I, I do a lot of free verse. I mean, I like to mix in a form poem every once in a while and then and kind of sneak attack them and say, yeah, you guys just read a sonnet. Um, but, uh, you know, there's there's no rules, really. Uh, in fact, I think my most read poem is a, a rattle prose poem called Mars and Venus uh -huh. um, by Kathleen Diane Nolan, um, and who has kind of that social work background you were alluding to. Um, cause so much of what we do is just dealing with people and, and trying to fight that impulse to be too paternalistic. And I, that poem is so disarming. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, let's hear another one of your poems. The next one is, uh, is a uh, smoke. All right. Smoke. Things we lost in the fires. Koala bears, obviously. Also less renowned species the long-footed Puderu, the Dunnert's hideaway, the ability to run long distances, to speak in full sentences, the luxury of hearing sirens without our minds stampeding, millennium trees, grandfather's plumed haberdashery, mom's plein air paintings, the desire to procreate, another taco truck in Miami Beach, plausible deniability, shade. By the time her head contacts the paper padding, both the scientist and the mother in her have already deduced the finding, knowing exactly what's wrong with the machine. She wants to speak up, to put her OB's mind at ease, but the young doctor seems so determined to fix the thing, as if one more turn of the dial and the baby's heartbeat will come back online and all will be well, but it won't be. Things we've gained, insecurity, the feeling that at any moment the gray ghost could slip through cracks in the siding, a new definition of home, meaning any place but the place where we've been living. Reckless end of the world sex nobody seems to be having. Activated alveolar macrophages. The knowledge that particles smaller than 2.5 micrometers will slip unnoticed past the mother's defenses, dissolve in her bloodstream, and take a clean shot through the umbilical vein. The stubborn insistence that even now there is such a thing as a safe space. Space big sky, black soil, seedlings. Yeah. So with a poem like that, it's, it's easy to imagine how, you know, how much you know, psychologically the process of writing poems about your patients and, and your practice helps you deal with the emotional stress and, and grief and the difficulty of, of that. Um, what do you think is, is actually going on with poems? Like what are poems? I, I think, um, in the essay, you talk about, um, you know, poems being shown to be neurostimulants and, and, you know, in, in coming from a perspective of somebody who, you know, works on the human body as like an animal and like we come through evolution to be what we are. Why is it that poems are so meaningful? What do they do? Um, what are they? Yeah, well, I think the idea of poems working on the body is, is something I was thinking about this afternoon as I, got caught in a little snow squall on a walk through the neighborhood. And I it was having sort of that, that forced visceral experience, um, uh, you know, by mother nature force, but, but a poem does that, right? I mean, a poem is a sensory experience and a poem 
I, I think is located in the body in ways that other forms of writing uh, aren't. And, and, and so what it does, what they do, I think, is they actually help connect us with our own bodies. You know, um, I was thinking about this, the C.S. Lewis uh, kind of admonishment. He was a, he's a staunch Catholic and he said, you don't, you don't have a soul, you are a soul, you have a body. And I actually think nowadays we have to be reminded of the opposite. You know, we are, we're used to being these sort of virtual uh, presences and, and, you know, the roles that we play at work in medicine. Um, but being called back to sort of that visceral experience is something that I think, you know, poems do really well. Yeah, it seems to me, and that just reminds me of it, that the reason why there's so much sort of negative reaction to poems, I think, is because it has that visceral effect on your body. You know, in the same way that, um, you know, a, a curse word will has, you know, it it plants itself in you, you know, in, your, in that broke is area because it's a, generated in a different spot. And it's sort of autonomous in that region of the brain. And, and so it's like forcing you to feel that emotion of the curse word, which is why we sort of, we say they're bad words and you shouldn't say them. Cause it's like mm -hmm. imposing an emotion on somebody else, like directly. And that's what poems do too, you know? And so confronting that and being forced to feel something is something that a lot of people resist, I think. So that's a great, a great way to put it, I think. Cause I think it's, it's very true. Yeah. I mean, we, you have to understand medicine these days, the way we operate is so disembodied. Um, our interactions, most of them are, are through a computer screen. Mm -hmm. You know, we see our patients for maybe an hour cumulatively each day between pre-rounding and rounding, and then maybe going back in the afternoon to deliver some results. And the rest of the time we're plugged into a computer. Yeah. You know, so so it's really important to be reminded that, you know, hey, we we have bodies, too. And, and we're not, by the way, we're not escaping any of what's going on on the other side of that bed. Yeah. Somebody mentioned, you know, because one of your your first poem you read, I think, uh, mentioned, you know, medicine is a broken system. And wanted to know as a doctor, like why you think it's broken. Is that what you were referring to? The fact that it's so disembodied or is it I mean, one of the things I think about a lot is the specialization you know, and, and that everybody sort of focused on such a narrow thing. You see it in science so much where, you know, somebody studying the, you know, electromagnetism in the ionosphere doesn't know anything about the heating in the uh, mesosphere or something. And, and there's just no like, um, you know, everything is so compartmentalized because we have to be so specific to know because we have so much knowledge um, that you have to specialize and compartmentalize. Um, and and is, is that what it is? What are you talking about? Or is it the, the coding and all the, the health, uh, you know, the, the ways that the funding works and things like that? Or what is yeah, it? What I, mean, mean? I, I will spare you my screed on, <laughs> on health policy um, and just say that in, in uh, the ICD-10 poem, I was referencing, you know, the, the payment and the, the lack of access to health care. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I do want to address the specialization. I mean, um, Wendell Berry gave this speech um, called uh, Health is Membership, which is like a guiding uh, essay for me. Um, and one of the things he notes is that the hospital is the place where the world of love meets the world of efficiency, mm -hmm. uh, which is to say the world of specialization. And you're absolutely right. I mean, we, you know, we are getting better and better at delivering quote unquote personalized medicine and really breaking people down into their component parts and figuring out which specialist goes with which part. Um, and, and what we don't realize unless we stop and reflect is that that's an extremely dehumanizing way uh, to go about your business and, and to, to view, you know, the other humans uh, in, that you're working with. Mm -hmm. um, and so one thing that, that poetry does, another thing is it, it sort of restores that sense of there being, you know, a broader world outside uh, of the hospital um, and, and, and life being bigger than all of these, you know, um, tiny windows that we're viewing it through. Mm -hmm. um, Probably my favorite feedback from Post Call Poetry was a tweet uh, a few years ago. Residents, uh, one resident took a picture, I guess, of the team and it said after Post Call Poetry. And there were like five residents and students and they were all leaning on a windowsill looking out the window. Hmm. And I thought, well, that's exactly what I'm going for. Mm -hmm.
Yeah, the the specialization part too. Um, it just makes me think of your the two hats you wear as a poet and doctor. Um, you know, is because poetry becomes a specialized thing too. Is it becomes an academic pursuit? You know, every English department has like two poets. You know, and they're the poets. And we have these <laughs> genres that we stick to as writers. And if you're not in that academic environment, it's really hard to you know be publishing and and putting out books and getting awards. And it's this whole system built on this little specialization of um, you know, people who couldn't be doctors because it's really hard. I mean, it must be hard to be in the poetry world um, while you know, having a day job that's so strenuous and takes so much of your time. Um, and, and, and then there's the idea, that too, that unless you, you know, go to MFA programs and have all that experience and become a professor, that you're not, um, you, know, you can't write poems as well as other people, and, and which is obviously not true, but we have this like, specialized mindset that you have to have all this education even to write poems, too. Um, so how, how has your experience been as a doctor trying to enter the literary world and, and publish things and, and share poems and, and write books? And, and how do you find time? You know, what is that experience like? Yeah, I mean, it, it's been lonely, but I think uh, I think it's always lonely for poets, isn't it? I mean, it's it's not like this is not the path to being a rock star. Um, yeah, I think I've, I've probably had fewer guides and I have thought, you know, what if I somehow got a sabbatical and I, I got to do an MFA like Abraham Verghese did and, you know, maybe I'd, you know, get a collection out finally. Um, but uh, mostly I'm content. I mean, I, I don't write poetry for the fame and the publications. I, I, I write because I, I just have to. I, it's, it's a compulsion. Um, and it is something that, it you know, I have figured out how these two worlds feed off of one another right you know i um i go through long periods where i'm not writing poetry um and i'm and you know i'm seeing patients and i'm working hard in the hospital um and i i used to think that was time wasted and and time you know lost uh, not writing but i think i think that's where the material that's the that's the experience and the material uh that eventually i draw from and and i've even learned that that sometimes when i'm in the midst of the Kind of the churn in the hospital that it's really useless and and even counterproductive to try to write um in that state because as you mentioned it's it's just not one conducive to the kind of uh reflective mode you need to be in mm -hmm. uh well uh, it's been a bit let's hear another poem uh, the problem with oxygen okay the problem with oxygen and there's an epigraph paris 1945 Good lungs are hard to keep clean, unclogged by tar, the dust stirred by moth's wings, mist that settles on the Seine some September mornings, and with the sunrise slides along that glassy plain. It is the end of summer, opposite VE day, and he has left on a pass, his recovery unit near the coast, and taken the train to the city where she works salvaging documents, love letters, maps. Their day spent ducking the past at turns effortless as drowning is paid for in pangs, the way the first deep draft stings upon breaking the surface, air punishing the chest with the memory of its absence. In time, echoes of laughter, the clink of glassware, even flashes of warlight between those banks, once indelible, diminish, as all things once bright and elastic. They return to the states, feel the years expand and collapse. She manages to quit with the first pregnancy, while he contracts a cough that will trail him across decades. Damage accumulates, the airy lattice thinning until it cracks and caves like ash. In the end, the problem with oxygen is reduced to physics, a volume problem, how to compress enough of it so the tank will last. All I want, he wheezes, casting an arm from his bed, is to take my wife to dinner See our breath freeze as we stop by the river, the stroke of oars that signal the dawn calling us back. 
And that was Gaetan Skro again reading uh, The Problem with Oxygen, another wonderful poem about uh, his, his work in medical practice. Um, so, so what is your, your writing practice like? I mean, you mentioned that class with Toy Derricotte, um, you know, and that you kind of have phases where you write or where you don't. Um, you know, what are you trying to do with poems when you sit down? You know, is there a certain, do you, you know, given that you're so busy with your day job, is there a time where you're like, oh, I need to write a poem about that? And so you're more inspiration driven? Or is there more times where like, I have some downtime, I'm going to write? And then, and how do you confront the, the open, empty page? Yeah, I'm bad. I'm really bad at the empty page, Tim. I mean, if I sat down and said I need to write really bad poems would start coming forth. Um, I, I, I start poems or I, I feel that I have a good start to a poem when I have a, a contradiction or a question that I, I just have an inkling that I'm not going to answer. You know, I think if you have a good answer in mind um that that's prose that's a nice essay um but it's sort of the that tension uh that i feel that's really the the seed of the poem um and then you know i'll 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 get a draft down and sometimes i'm off and running and other times you know i set it aside and what i'm looking for is kind of that that moment that grabs you um I tend to write poems when, when I'm in that moment, like I know I'm close to the end and it, it could seize me for a few days in a row where my wife will be like, dude, stop like staring off in the space, like writing that poem in your head. Um, you know, so I'm looking for that when it grabs me and it, it forces me to finish it, but that could be months after the initial draft. Mm -hmm. And what do you do for, you know, do you have time to do, you know, workshops and things like that? Or do you, do you read a lot? Um, how do you sort of refine your craft when you have so much else going on? Well, Tim, you know, I'm wondering if a lot of what I'm doing with the students is, is my time. I, I, I read a lot and I read a lot because I'm reading to them and I'm reading, I'm reading a lot of poems to figure out where, what are going to be good poems to read to them. Um, so, so those are definitely generative moments. That's, that's a lot of reading. Um, in terms of workshops, um, I do a fair amount of editing uh, for other people, and I find that to be extremely, um, you know, not generative necessarily, but I think it helps me a little bit hone the craft. Um, I've recently gotten into, um, you know, editing uh, like a medical humanities section of a medical journal, so um, starting to appreciate your job more and more. Um, but yeah, no, I... I uh, I, I do think, you know, what if I had some more time and, and got to spend, you know, dedicated time in a workshop? That's the dream, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I definitely, I mean, even though I'm here doing this all the time, I feel just the rare times you get to sit down just to write. And it doesn't come up very often, um, yeah. you know, over an extended period of time anyway, like a half an hour here, maybe in there. And that's about it. Um, so so what do you look for, you know, in writing a poem? Um, you know, do you, what are you trying to convey? Are you writing for yourself, would you say, or for an audience to try to understand your perspective? What do you have in mind when the poem goes on the page? Yeah, I don't, I don't think about audience too much. I mean, I think there, there are certain poems that I've written. A Physician's Grammar is one of them where I, I am pretty self-consciously addressing, um, my colleagues and, um, you know, I, the language we use in medicine has been kind of a bugaboo of mine for years. And so, you know, there's certain poems. In fact, I just, I just finished one uh, called Noncompliant that's in that group. But for the most part, again, I think if I sat down um, to write a poem that's going to teach a lesson, that's not going to work. Um, I, again, I, I think the poems that work best for me are ones that sort of scope a problem, pose an interesting question, um, but, but don't necessarily try too hard to to put the answer down mm -hmm. yeah well that's definitely great advice that's that's how it has to be done i think to be successful uh let's let's hear another one of the poems uh let's do uh, this life is a fox i stole okay this life is a fox i stole um and this is for clovis butch ash what will not make sense to those so fond of combat when my time comes, I will go gently. Despite my younger age, the still hard lines of my body, my faith, despite the raw and fraying fibers of my being. 
for my family's sake, I refuse to betray this pain. For years, I served below decks, assembling ordinances, addressing packages of hellfire delivered on blade thin wings of death. While in the darkness of that dread machine, reactors glowed and set my marrow free. Though decades passed before we named the beast. Like me, there was a boyish thief who kept a secret pinned against his breast. And even as the feral pup, all snarl and claw and starving, bared its fangs and started gnawing, even as the wound outgrew his slender frame, the Spartan tightened his embrace. Like him, I love the light no less for lack of raging, would rather save my breath and bear the teeth. After all, this life is a fox I stole, and foxes need to eat. Yeah, love that poem, especially the last, the last few lines. Uh, great poem. Uh, the life is a fox I stole, or this life is a fox I stole um, by Guyton Scro. And um, <clears throat> so, so that brings up a question. So I assume that is written after a patient of yours, right? In the, in, you know, monologuing and personifying, you know, them. And um, what do you feel about that? About, uh, do you have any reservations for writing just about, not necessarily that, but writing about people in abstract ways that you come through um, the hospital is there anything you know caution that you take or do you do you feel like um you know is that something that, that you think about a lot yeah no i have, i have deep reservations about it and i i got permission from that patient and 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 later after he passed from his family to publish that poem um i, I try to avoid it i mean i i think um you know, I think there's an old school of thought that that, you know, doctors can write about whatever, you know, experiences they have and, and you know, patient privacy and, and um, uh, autonomy to be damned. Um, I, I'm definitely not in that school. In fact, I, I really worry about the ethics of us, you know, transforming the material of a clinical encounter into, uh, you know, art in its highest form, but I think it can be, it can be, you know, a lot less. Mm -hmm. um, so it's something I've definitely written a number of persona poems that are more um, composites and, and, and certainly not recognizable like this one is, but mm -hmm. this was a really special uh, a patient. And, um, um, you know, I just, I felt uh, especially with his family's permission that I wanted to honor him. Yeah. Well, it's one of those things, I think, you know, those moments, you know, those kind of people you meet and experiences you have are the really charged things. They're really interesting things or things you have to process, you know, and then there are things that we not having access to see how life works like that at, at those stages, you know, until you're forced to be there eventually is, um, you know, it, it's where we can learn and get the most from, too. So it must be there are a lot of, you know, tempting to draw from those experiences as much as possible, I would have to think, because, you know, we want to hear them, too. Well, sure. I mean, I, again, I, I think there's a, a way there's many ways to draw from experience without, um, you know, without without identifying people at the at the very least. Mm -hmm. um, and, and again, I, I think, um, you know, if, if I just scribbled off a bunch of persona poems that would feel a little bit more like reporting to me. Um, you know, I think the material, when the material settles to sort of that imaginative depth that Michael Longley talks about, um, by that time, the person is probably somewhat unrecognizable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, they definitely are in, in every poem except for that, where you identify them very clearly. Um, so if you have any questions for Guyton, uh, let me know. Just leave them in the chat windows, either on Facebook or YouTube. I'll pass them along. Um, also, at this time, I should remind you to click the like buttons. we got a lot more people watching than likes, so click the like button. Don't forget, because if I say that, they get more, and then uh, more people watch it on the sidebar later. So it's worth noting uh, that. Let, let's hear the next poem, Caitlin. Sorry, Tim, I don't have the cue. What do you have in mind? Oh, I got, um, it's the one that's shaped like an American flag, which is oh, good yeah. that we're, we're stalling a little bit because I have to make sure I fit it on the screen for everyone to see. Yeah, this is, a, this, is a, this is a formatting challenge. In fact, 
This one wound up in an art show because I don't think a journal could deal with this. Yeah, it um, would be difficult. Um, you, know, you have to publish <laughs> it. You have to publish it sideways, I think, and then um, which is possible, definitely. And hope that out. there's enough room, but I'm not sure if there would be. Maybe, <laughs> yeah. But anyway, let's. Um, I'll put it on screen, um, very small first, and then uh, we'll make it bigger. <laughs> <laughs> Let me get readable. But yeah, this is a untitled American or untitled American 2020. Yeah. So here, oops, sure. this is um, where it go. And you can see this is a found poem consisting of unedited excerpts from CNN's bottom line hashtag CNN Town Hall, April 2023, uh, 20, April 23, 2020 at 9 p.m. precisely. How long do asymptomatic carry virus in their body? Is there a plan to do random testing? How will summer camp work with social distancing? Can the virus be transmitted by touching tennis balls? Is life back to normal in hashtag Wuhan? How are Native Americans faring? Why are there tests available for pets and zoo animals? Do I need to be worried about my cat? Is it safe to give blood? Is it safe to visit my grandchildren? Does the virus live in grass or pavement? How long does it stay on surfaces like subway seats and handrail? How do you tell the difference between allergies and COVID-19? Why is it that some people have different symptoms? Why does the USA have many more deaths? How can students and staff be safe in school with 30 kids in one class? What kinds of masks should kids wear? Does constant use of hand sanitizer make it any less effective? How long does the virus take on your face before traveling into your respiratory tract? Can COVID-19 be a cause of heart failure? Can sunlight kill coronavirus? Is it safe to go to the dentist? How are they progressing regarding a vaccine? When will it be safe to go back to college? What are your thoughts on personal swimming pool use this summer? Do they think mosquitoes will be able to spread the virus? Can coronavirus travel on cigarette smoke? How long do you think can quarantine last? How do I talk to someone who doesn't understand the gravity of the situation? Does the federal government have the power to shut down Georgia? What exactly is the criteria for recovered? How long will we live with the virus? And that was uh, the untitled, the untitled uh, shape poem, the concrete poem, um, American 2020. And can you talk about that. How did that poem come to be? And why did you decide to, to make a found poem like that out of those um, old comments? Well, I, I think like a lot of people uh, listening, I was sitting in my living room during this was during the, the first two weeks of the lockdown, I believe. And so we were all just watching our television screens and and waiting for the updates. And and CNN was doing these town halls where they encourage you to get on social media and use that hashtag CNN town hall and submit your questions. And the questions were just scrolling across the bottom line. And I first I'm just reading them in, in, a, in a straightforward way. And then I realized, well, this is <laughs> this is what toy taught me. Toy toy was obsessed with, you know, teaching me how to love the line and appreciate the line and, and how, you know, every every line has to stand on its own. Um, and, and if it does, then relationships start to form. And that and I started to see the relationships between these questions that were scrolling in and it started to feel like a poem to me. So I then started furiously writing them down word for word. And uh, I, I changed the order, but I, I promise you, I did not edit any of those questions. Mm -hmm. So what was your, your experience like? I mean, the pandemic, you're, you're the second doctor we've had, uh, actually, uh, Rachel Malalu was on maybe a year and a half ago. And, um, and she, you know, it was really, and it, it continued at that point to be, you know, uh, I don't know, just life alteringly traumatic, maybe you could say, I mean, just the, the onslaught of patients, the sort of eventual lack of support after the, the, you know, early periods where everybody was like a hero 
you know, and it just sort of the long gruel, the public kind of couldn't keep up with it. And I think a lot of people in my, it seems from other people who published too, felt sort of like forgotten almost. Um, what was your experience like uh, during the pandemic? Was it similar to that? Well, I, I, yeah, I'm afraid so. I mean, I, I do want to say like in, in, in respect for my colleagues that I was not, um, it, it, in the early days, I was not seeing a lot of COVID patients because our hospital made the decision um, to keep those patients off of the teaching services because with us, you were exposed to three or four doctors. And so it just made sense from an infection prevention standpoint. Um, but, you know, definitely that changed later on. And my wife is a pediatrician, so she was on the front lines, very unprotected in a pediatrics office. Um, and so we went through the whole thing in terms of the emotions. I mean, I, I do, I remember the fear in the beginning, um, and particularly when a lot of physicians um, in China and in Italy were dying. Um, you know, we were making wills. You know, that, that's finally what got us to make a will, you know, in the late 30s. Um, and then, you know, we moved into the, the phase of vaccines and, and having some treatments and knowing a little bit more what to do. Um, and, and so, you know, feeling like we um, were just getting things under control. And then, you know, I think the third wave for us has been that shift in, in public opinion and, and just the way that, um, you know, people's distrust for the system at large has grown in, in ways, some of which are understandable. Um, but but that have really left a permanent impact on, on the, the relationships that we have uh, with our patients, and and that um, you know is is pretty regrettable. Yeah, I mean, it seems like just overall we're living in an era where distrust in systems and institutions is like rampant, and you know maybe you know healthcare and, and the medical aspect, not the billing and, and the insurance aspect, but the actual aspect of doctors and, and science being sort of a savior was maybe one of the last things standing in trusting institutions. And, and now that's kind of gone too. Do you think poetry has a role to play in correcting that maybe? I mean, if, if more doctors were poets and we got to see that personal perspective and the nuance of actual, you know, human beings behind the white coats, do you think that would help? Is that something that you think about? Well, I, I thought about it when you mentioned that the, 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 kind of persona of the doctor is this sort of cold clinical um, automaton almost. And, and, and truthfully, that's, that's a persona that we inhabit and we actively propagate at times. Um, but absolutely, I, I think if the general public even understood, you know, why I feel the need to re read poems to the doctors so that they can have you know, a half an hour to process some of the things that they're going through. I, th I think that would be very humanizing. And I think, I think that's what you're getting at. Um, you know, we need to be, you know, I talked about how we need to see our patients as human and not these compartmentalized uh, kind of buckets of organs. Um, but, you know, I think that probably works both ways. Mm -hmm. So have you had any, um, you know, your students, um, you know, who you're reading poems to, do you teach writing poems at all too? Is that something you've thought about and have any taken up writing or is it more receptive? Yeah, it's so far, um, so far in, in terms of poetry, it's all receptive. Um, you know, you, you asked me, what's it like to be a poet on a, in a medical center or, um, you know, a doctor on a poetry podcast. And I, I, I don't inhabit either of those uh, personalities very comfortably. <laughs> so I don't think I'm ready to teach poetry. Um, but a, we do, a couple of colleagues of mine have been teaching a, a course at Pitt Med called um, Narrative um, and the Experience of Illness uh, for years. And, and we do a lot of reading of poems um, and fiction and we do a writing uh, part there. So mm -hmm. uh, yeah, there's a little bit of teaching of medical students how to write. Yeah. And, and what about uh, working, in, you know, with patients in that more traditional way of um, they call it cryptotherapy? What's the word for it? There's a word I'm drawing a blank, but there's a whole sort of wing of therapy with, with some decent literature about it um, as using, you know, writing as therapy. Um, have you, you know, gone to poetry in times of sort of personal need while speaking to patients? Um, I have shared poems with patients, um, especially ones that have, um, you know, indicated a receptiveness to it. I, I've also worked, um, again, with some of the, the MFA students at Pitt through the years, um, 
they've done some neat workshops for veterans um, in terms of writing poetry. Actually, we're doing one um, with with a woman whose interest is in disability studies and writing uh, coming up in the spring. So I, I like to kind of partner with other people on campus uh, when it comes to the, the writing therapy mm. part. Yeah. Well, um, let's see. Let's do another poem. Uh, let's do the next one. And the next was um, Weights and Measures. Okay. Weights and Measures. We waste a good 10 minutes bullshitting about albumin and performance status and a smudge no larger than a thumbprint that could make all the difference. All of these measurable things faint flickers against more darkness and not a shade closer to the heart of it, to making her wedding or not. And thank goodness the room is dim as even unfinished sentences, dashes dangling mid-breath. Even the atmosphere this evening is sore and significant, everything leaving marks. Such scars as I should understand, and yet my eyes still slip outside, as if the answer lies in blackness behind the curtain of the ridge. And later, I am rocking off to sleep my baby daughter, every edge of her collapsed against me, such heavy limbs and quaking breaths, no match for such a fragile frame. And through the ruffled drapes, the yawning gravities of all those bleary stars are still no measure for this weight. And that was another poem by um, Gaten Scro, Weights and Measures. I'm not sure, um, is it published in JAMA? We have the little advertisement on the side. Yeah, that one was in JAMA. JAMA. Yeah, and so I wanted to talk about that um, aspect of publishing poems. You know, we tend to think, we get stuck in this sort of pit, maybe, of thinking that poems belong in literary magazines or rattle. And or maybe the New Yorker is like a little handbag that they can accessorize with. Um, but but then, you know, we don't think about publishing poems other places. And the fact that Gemma publishes poems sometimes, um, it, it gets poems in front of like a wide audience that wouldn't usually read poetry. It seems like such a wonderful thing to do. Something I've always told myself that like, I'm going to stop publishing in literary magazines and start finding <laughs> other places to publish. I know like Nate Jacob, one of the regular viewers here, publishes in his local newspaper, uh, which is just wonderful too. Um, and, and there's just so many other places, but we sort of get caught in the, just the, you know, the routine of doing the literary magazines. So what's your experience been like um, publishing poems places like JAMA? Yeah, I mean, I, I really appreciate um, uh, medical journals like JAMA, Annals of Internal Medicine, Journal of General Internal Medicine. These are all journals that have dedicated, you know, copy space, uh, you know, text to either uh, reflective essays or poetry. Um, and, and they're hugely popular. You know, I've talked to editors and they say, you know, everyone reads JAMA Poetry and Medicine, everyone meaning the doctors who subscribe to JAMA. Mm -hmm. um, uh, at the same time, it's a little strange because these are peer reviewed journals. And so the, the screening process, the publication process is all kind of, you know, kind of shoved into this, you know, peer review process that's really intended for scientific manuscripts. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I submit to JAMA, I've got to fill out all these conflict of interest forms and, you know, did I share the article with all the authors? Uh, so it's, it's kind of surreal, but I mean, ultimately, Again, it's it's uh, some of these poems are intended for that medical audience, and I, I I'm afraid they're more likely to read them in JAMA uh, than in Rattle. I'm trying to change that. I, I've signed up quite a few people for the daily email. Well, we have. Um, I had this other thing called Leave Your Lit. Where I was trying to do this hashtag on Twitter, but it, and then the pandemic came. I kind of forgot about it. But um, but just leaving after you're done with literary magazines, leaving them in doctor's offices and waiting rooms so people could read them there um, and then take a picture and post it. Maybe we got to start that up again. Um, oh, I like that. But, but so, so for JAMA, do you have to be like, do you have to have certain credentials to submit poems? Um, no, no. I mean, you, it won't surprise you that some of the best poems I've come across in JAMA are, are written by people. You know, people who are not physicians who are not necessarily connected to medicine. So, so people have figured out, lay people have figured out a way to to submit to these places. 
Yeah, I mean, it just seems. And, and do you hear, you know, do you hear feedback? Because one of the things I just was talking to somebody who mentioned, you know, the, the dejecting thing about literary magazines is you publish them, you know, not Rattle, of course, <laughs> but uh, in other ones, and you don't hear anything back from anybody who's read them. It's sort of like dropping them into a well and you're like waiting for the splash. You're like, maybe that's uh, Mel's hole instead to call back to a previous episode. But, um, um, yeah, do you fe- have feedback from doctors who appreciate that? And, and, and do you hear more than that from than when you, you know, publish in a literary magazine? I mean, to be honest, yes, but the, but medical journals have the built-in structural advantage of institutional subscribers, mm-hmm. right? So, so you know, every doctor at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center has a subscription to JAMA, and you know, again, they may have an easier time reading my poem than they will a ten-page scientific paper. So, um, yeah, I, I tend to hear. Um, more feedback on the ones that are in the medical journals. Um, but, uh, you know, I, 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 I have become more selective in, in terms of what I'm sending um, and, and a little more conscious of trying to uh, kind of earn my literary journal bona fide. So. Mm-hmm. Did you feel like a need to do that? Like, do you feel like um, in the same way, like if I was going to the hospital thinking I know something about medicine, it would be a problem. Do you feel that way at all within the poet or do you feel welcome? Because you know, the, the reason Rattle is founded was to make people feel welcome. So, I mean, I know you feel welcome here, I hope, but uh, in general, yeah. does it feel that way or do you feel like an outsider while you're in literary circles? Well, you know, again, I, I, I'm just like have this permanent out group identity, I think, because I never thought I'd you know, was medical school material. And and now, you know, I don't think I'm lit mag material either. Um, so that's probably my own um, neuroticism. Um, but, you know, I really do appreciate the inclusivity of Rattle. And, and, and one thing that I think is really neat is the emphasis on, you know, poets with day jobs. And I, I, one of my favorite chat books is, is a plumber's guide to the light. Mm-hmm. I read it all the time at work because it's so there's so many parallels between a trade and medicine. And I just love the focus on the concrete, the everyday, which is, you know, how William Carlos Williams got all this poetry and medicine stuff started. And I I don't think there's, um, that's an accident. I think there's something um, imminently practical about medicine uh, that translates really well to poetry. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, Let's, uh, let's do, let's do both. Let's do uh, why I started and a little, a couple more questions, and then uh, and we'll end up with the one from Rattle too. I think it's a great closing poem. But let's do uh, why I startled. Okay. I just want to say one of the seeds of this poem was an experience I had in med school. Uh, we were in our geriatrics block, and we were talking about dementia. And I was a volunteer. I got up in front of this auditorium with 250 of my classmates, and um, the instructor had me wear these goggles that were sort of scratched up and meant to mimic cataracts. Um, and they put some mufflers on my ears so that I couldn't hear well. Um, and then in front of the whole class, they didn't tell me what they were gonna do, they started undressing me. And I, I startled. And so uh, that experience, which was supposed to teach me, I guess, some empathy for people with dementia is, is one thing I had in mind when I wrote this. Uh, why I startled. During storms, I used to inch along the rafters in the barn to perch in a windowless dormer that overlooked the pond. Curtains of rain would trawl across, bristling the surface before driving on. I'd crouch there eavesdropping, absorbing the chatter between sheet metal and falling water until my head was full of rain. Today, your voice sounds like this. In December, the great room dim and full of embers, I'd drag a chair across the floorboards to press my cheek against a pane. Facing sideways, squinting, frost would blossom and clear in time with my breathing. Until Sarah came and shielding me from mother, set me down on the floor again. A clouded glass that blurs the line of earth and sky belongs to her. Today, my eyes work like this. The way you stole into my room this morning and leaning over, set your hand against my shoulder. I thought you were my mother. 
I was just remembering the weight of her beside me, the shock of the mattress heaving, how I understood without her speaking. Your hand inside my gown, the metal pressed against my skin, I felt a shiver coming on and saw the leaves begin to turn upwards, pale faces towards the sky. Yeah, another great poem. That was why I startled and a great story, too. It seems to me like that's a metaphor, too, for what poetry does. I mean, such a great exercise in empathy to actually see, you know, what it would be like to be a patient like that, you know, um, with you know, limited, you know, perception and, and trying to understand what's going on and, and being confused and difficult. And then but you're embodying that. And when you're doing a reading a poem or reading someone else's poem, their voice is embodying you. And then, you know, and then to get to see that perspective, too, just this the wonderful thing about poetry. I love that story. Um, and, and that's, I think, one of the reasons why it'd be great if, you know, doctors and just the more people that are writing and sharing poetry and thinking about the world that way and, and thinking what life's like through other people's eyes and voice is just such a great thing. Um, yeah. So thanks so much for sharing that. Yeah. Um, and then, so, so what do you have, um, you know, we're coming up on time. What do you have, do you have a body of work that you're thinking about, um, putting together as a book? Um, is that something that's like way down the line? Um, do you think about like taking a sabbatical at some point and working on a book? Um, what is, uh, what is your ambition, I guess, when it comes to poetry is what I'm asking. Yeah, no, I, I do want to put a collection out. I, I, I think I'm getting closer. I, let's put it this way. I think <laughs> the poems I'm I'm happy with um, the, the 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 collection of poems I'm happy with has grown past the chapbook size. It's somewhere inching its way towards you know a, a full book. Um, uh, I I think uh, what I'm waiting for, really truthfully, is is that that same kind of uh, gripping you know, the compelling force that caused me to finish a poem. I, I think I'm waiting for that um, to, to help me kind of put the stamp on this group of poems and then figure out how to get it published mm -hmm. uh, but it's coming yeah well definitely because it's just it's such a great perspective to be able to see and, and that's something you get every day and that's the whole point of what you know we don't want a world in which um you know only professors and people with master's degrees in poetry or poets it just doesn't make any sense but hearing from people from all over the place including doctors uh, it's just so valuable and, and makes poetry worth reading i mean the plumber's guide to light is probably my favorite chapter we published too it's just such a wonderful book um, so, so what, when you look back, you know, are there certain experiences, did you know at the time that there, there are poems in there, you know, I like, can you, can you envision the book that you're thinking about because you have these, like, what would it be? Do you, do you have an idea of that? <laughs> uh, what would the book be? Um, yeah, yeah, in the same way that you have, you know, you, you, there's a moment that you know you might write a poem about, and then, uh, you know, you said months later you might write the poem. Do you have a sense of, of what the book would focus on at all? Like, like looking at the well, poems you've I, written? I think, it's, yeah. I think it would focus on a lot of the themes we've talked about, and probably at its core the idea of, of sort of, you know, a doctor being pulled back to that, you know, that center of gravity, which is you know, his own humanity, his own visceral experience of the world um, and, and being led there by, um, you know, the, these people that inhabit the poems. Yeah, well, that's I'm really looking forward to it. Um, we know whenever it comes out, and I'm sure it will at some point. Um, and interesting, you mentioned gravity because the weight is the poem that uh, we'll be ta reading last. So why don't you read uh, the weight to close it out? OK. The weight. How much does a hospital weigh? I've tried to estimate. Fluorescent tiled corridors, star-crossed, friends arriving late. Bags of saline, laundry trucks, arresting lights and spoiling plates. The best laid plans, the bitter ends, slant rhymes to ease the breaks. I added up the midnights and multiplied the days divided by the setbacks and factored in the grace, untied a stack of letters and checked the book of names. But after all of this accounting, the sum was something out of range. What is it like to feel the lightning of such weight? For weeks, the leaves along the drive have scorched the corners of my eyes, 
until today I stepped outside and saw the naked branches dancing. From across the neighbor's fields, the verse came charging. The hard clay shook. Yeah, such a great poem. A uh, great poem to end on. It's a great poem generally. I love that idea of, of what is the weight? How much does a hospital weigh? Um, wonderful poem. Thanks so much for talking to, to me, Gaten. It's been just wonderful you know, hearing your perspective and, and getting to share your poems. Thank you so much for the opportunity, Tim. Yeah, yeah. thank you and hope to see you again soon. Okay. All right, take care. Bye. Yeah, bye. that was Gaten Scro. Uh, you can find uh, all of his work, including, which we didn't talk about, he has fiction and um, other work too on his website. Um, and that website is um, gaytonscrow.com. That's G A E T A N S G R O.com. So find a whole bunch of his work, um, including uh, uh, you know, blog type entries, other poems, all sorts of things there. And uh, now we're going to go to our prompt lines. Um, and so, did I do this right? Let me, I got to do this one second. I didn't update it. I keep forgetting that I have to update the slide. This is like the fourth time in a row. That I haven't added the right one. So here we go. So the prompt for this week was to, if I can find it, there we go. Okay. So the prompt for this week was to uh, move through an unnatural environment and describe it as though you were writing a nature poem. So that's this week's prompt. Um, you know, an unnature poem. What is going on there? Hang on a second. Okay. Well, anyway, um, yeah, that is the, uh, I think, I think my Google was asking me to do something. I got, it, it thought I was talking to it. Anyway, that was the, that was the uh, prompt for this week and how to share a poem, uh, a poem, two page max, uh, first email it to prompt lines at rattle.com. That's prompt lines, all one word at rattle.com. Then join the zoom link, which I'm about to share both on the chat windows on Facebook and YouTube. Um, only if you'd like to share a poem, join us there at those links on Zoom. If you'd like to just listen and enjoy the poems, um, feel free to sit tight right where you are. The best experience is YouTube because you get to see the poems while the poets are reading them. Everything is sort of choreographed and guidelined and, and uh, edited by me as we go. So stay where you are on the Zoom. But if you want to share a poem, uh, do join the Zoom uh, right now at that link, which I'm pinning to the top. And I'll be right back in just a moment with some more poetry. back thanks so much for your patience now like i said the prompt for this week was to write a poem um move through an unnatural setting so something that's just not typical um, of a nature poem but then write it as if it were a nature poem um and katie has ode to an airplane bathroom we do spend a lot of time in airplanes so it makes a lot of sense katie, that that's what you did yeah i'll put it uh i'll put it over here let's see if i can do this you can be close enough to you to read it okay so we'll do it there. Why don't you go ahead and read your ode to an airplane bathroom? Okay, written on an airplane, I should say also, but not in the bathroom. <laughs> so there's that. Wait, hang on one second. Let me, let me get this screen right. Okay, so we need this. Um, actually, yeah, one second, one second. This. We got to go to... The, oh, 
this one. <laughs> okay, and then we'll do this. Sorry, it's a lot to shift around. Okay, there we go. So there's an ode to an airplane bathroom. It was much like shifting to walk to the airplane bathroom itself. <laughs> it's a little bit. Okay. Ode to an airplane bathroom. Why is it that scuttling inside you was always a release? Uh-oh. I suppose there's a pun rolled up in there, along with the smell from someone afraid to hear the roar of the flush. And who knows how long the rain will let me wash my hands when I slam your faucet down just so you can spit on me. I hope that's water on your jungle floor, and pardon me for asking, but how could anyone join a club and swing above the sinkhole with all these marching lines of grime? Yet I'll miss your sunless little room, where, thanks to free coffee, I'll be back soon. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> Love that last line. Uh, <laughs> and um, I think I counted 14 lines, right, Katie? So it is an American sonnet. It is Thank an American you for noticing. Sonnet. Yeah. <laughs> and I went with your favorite um, sonnet, Minus One. Oh, nice. So, so here is my poem, um, Morning in the Mall at Christmas, mm. which was a really kind of easy poem to write because um, a week ago on Sunday, I took my kids to the mall. Um, and then this Sunday, we went to a, like a pondy thing. And so I just kind of like merged them in my brain. And here we go. Morning in the mall at Christmas. How gently the early birds float on the mirrored floor, whole flocks gliding over its gleaming surface without a sound or ripple. One of them dives briefly into the bloom of her bright bag and disappears, returns empty handed, a slight frown on her face. Others paddle in pairs past the kingfishers at the water's edge, past the chorus of frogs on their center pads. There is song in the air. Even the dragonflies dart with purpose between the crowds and the reeds, as if the whole of the earth were sprouting from seeds. Oh, that's great. So that is my morning in the mall at Christmas. It makes me both want to go to a mall and go on a walk. So I think you did the prom perfectly. <laughs> well, you could, you could walk at the mall. I hear a lot of people do that. So. I used to do that with my grandmother. I'm a big fan. <laughs> Nice. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So those were our prompt poems. Let's see what everybody else has. And I'm going to have to like readjust this. Let me see. We'll go like this and then I'll have to redo it in a second. But OK, so uh, let's go first to the first person here, which was Carla Schwartz. Hey, Carla, how are you doing? Oh, you got to unmute yourself, I think, still. Sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, fine. I'm here. <laughs> and thank you, uh, Katie and Tim. What a what you gave great poems and a great interview, Tim. And um, I wrote a poem and my man made thing, because this is how I interpreted this thing, not unnatural, but man made mm -hmm. was um, was a uh, poetry. <laughs> oh, interesting. Well, that definitely is unnatural. <laughs> so well, certainly it's man made or woman made so um let me just bring it to a place where i can i can read it um oh wait i'll just oh jeez here we go uh, that's okay i can relate carla i was having trouble too <laughs> okay okay uh, okay well it's not for some reason it's not readable right now um but let me let me just okay something happened oh you know what okay uh Okay, sorry about this. No, um, no at all. And that's um, a good I'm, title. I've, I've gotten a sneak preview of the title. I'm excited. Yeah, um, poem that requires yeah. a kitchen sink. <laughs> poem that <laughs> requires a, a kitchen sink. And I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna get it just by searching right here. Um, and here, okay. Uh, you know, it's one of those things where Zoom has decided to take over my video thing, and so I can't. Let me just do this here. And here, okay, so a poem that requires a kitchen sink. I thought I was going to read it. Let me just menu. Well, we can wait uh, and come back if you want. Um, yeah. Um, can you come back to me next? I will. <laughs> yeah, no problem. We'll go to, we'll thank go you. to Joe Cotton thank next. Thank you. I'm sorry. And, and Carla knows, of course, it's just a technical malfunction. But I should remind everybody to have the poem in front of you because of that delay. You can't read it off your YouTube stream either. No, you it was there. You have your own. <laughs> But, but Carla knows. I mean, Carla's a <laughs> yeah. veteran. <laughs> but let's go yeah. to Joe Cottonwood instead. Hey, Joe. Hey. Uh, yeah, how are you doing today? I'm um, good. And I, I got to confess, when I hit get a prompt, I usually go off on a slant. Well, that's what we love. Yeah. I love seeing how far anybody hear. can slant it. <laughs> <laughs> well, when, when I saw Unnatural Environment, my brain immediately went to my wood shop, mm -hmm. uh, for better or worse. Um, so I'm combining nature uh, that way. 
So anyway, it's called Welcome to the Woodshop. Neighbor boy Kai, with a stretch, presses crock on clutch of his father's half-restored 41 Ford, which rolls down the steep driveway. Oh, yes! Though steering this beast of a coupe, oops, needs more muscle than a gamer's thumb. For the damage to my fence, Kai will spend the day in my wood shop, and we shall build, by his father's wishes, an urn for Kai's future ashes. Hopefully in the far distant future, but the dad thinks it's time for Kai to think ahead. First step, Kai, is to choose the tree whose life ended to enclose your dusty shadow. There's pine, so soft, so eager to be shaped, scented of sugar, but easily injured by a careless blow and craved by hungry insect. There's fur, which is stiff, unbending to storm, tougher than pine, but prone to splinters, digging deep into flesh. There's oak so hard your enemies can't nail, but so resistant your teachers can't bend. There's acacia with wild whirls of grain appealing to the eye, unpredictable to the chisel. There's spalted beech and spalted birch, attractive to the touch of hands, with pretty lines of blue and white the trace of fungus, of creeping rot. There's mahogany and there's ebony, strong in character, rich in shade, disrespected by fools who seek the blonde. There's redwood, soft, scented like blood, easily exploited, but outliving fire, outlasting dinosaurs, bending with storms, pacifist with memory of millennia. Or there's bird's eye maple staring back at the life you've sanded and shaped. As you work, Kai, in sawdust, give gratitude to the trees. Ah, that's great. Thanks so much for sharing that, Joe. And I love, uh, I've always wondered how much comparison you could make between woodworking and poetry. It seems like the process must be so similar on like a metaphorical level, you know, of like finding the right pieces of wood to shape and then having to put them together in a way that doesn't fall apart. You know, I can imagine all the things and the different types of wood there were interesting too. No, I think it's very similar. You get obsessed and you want to get it right. You just focus. <laughs> yeah, that's I mean, a great that's... way to put it. Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks, Joe. That was Welcome to the Woodshop uh, by Joe Cottonwood. Thanks, Joe. Um, okay, next up, let's go back to Carla Schwartz. Hey, Carla. I, I have it. Uh, Excellent. It's, it's a long story about computers screwing yeah, well, up. Well, but... don't have to tell me. I mean, almost every week there's something that, like, is not how it's supposed to be. And then I'm, like, trying to pretend that nothing's going wrong, but it right. definitely is. Nobody ever knows. <laughs> Nobody knows. This was, a this was a failure. But anyway, this is called A Poem That Requires a Kitchen Sink. Today I woke and poems fell from the sky. Pages of them raining down, so soaked, I couldn't read the words. Suddenly, a cold front turned the poems to ice, then snow. Like starlings, flocks of formal poems swerved and spiraled through up above. Sorry, I remember I changed that. Like a snowflake, one page floated down and landed on my face. Like when I peeled away the melted mush, I could make out just one phrase, plant me and I'll grow. Today, tiny poems sprout like fresh spring greens. I'll snip cuttings and eat them raw until they flower to bear sonnet-worthy seeds. What's for dinner? I hear you ask. But need you this fine eve? The answer isn't obvious. 
ginger, pepper, onion, mushroom, garlic, stir fried poetry. <laughs> That's a great ending. <laughs> yeah, that is a great ending. It took a, took a twist at the end there. And I, I love the, the beginning, though. Their poetry falling, yeah. falling from the sky, too. What a vivid uh, start to that poem, too. Thanks for sharing that, Carla. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you so yep. much. Take care. It was Carla Schwartz with uh, a poem that requires a kitchen sink. Great title, too. <laughs> Um, next up, let's go to Stephen Croft. Hey, Tim. Hey, Stephen. Um, I'm going to read an imagined nature poem, oh. but uh, let me put in a plug for myself. I've got a chat book of genuine nature poems out this month. Um, anybody who's interested can go to the poetry box forward slash bookstore and find out more about it. Oh, actually, uh, I think isn't I think the poetry box might be um uh, do, what's the name of the person who runs that? I think he used to come on. John Sean, it's a it well, there's a couple people involved, but mm -hmm. um the person I've uh, worked with is Sean and it's something like Avenigo. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking of. Yeah, well, yeah. very cool. Congratulations on that book. And yeah. we'll check it out. The poetry box. So, um yeah. again, the this one's an imagined nature poem. And uh, before before 9-11, I was a college professor for about four years before I got involved with the Army. So I'm drawing on that at the end of the poem. Mm -hmm. um, this is Land of the Optimistic Poets. At city's end, away from its central towers, traffic light after traffic light, billboard after billboard, past strip clubs, liquor stores, bad neighborhoods, to the broken edge of the built environment and on, riding now the scrape of diesel train wheels past smoking factories, brownfield tank farms, on past roundup crops in an expanse of agro mega fields, on foot now down the trail of high voltage lines, walking on to a broken forest, growing in civilizations, cast out debris, and up now, past the bent fuselage of a plane caught in the climate storm's torsion, which could not climb, clear the mountain, left here as a totem of escape's impossibility. And over the mountain, over a disturbed ocean dotted by ships trailing industrial fishing nets and on to a desert land, its once green and vibrant contours leveled by the blast wave when everything went wrong, and on to where plants struggle to grow again, and on in a sudden field of wildflowers before a bay with a glass-bottomed ferry, like it has been waiting to cross these new waters filled with sea life to an unexpected land of forests and general and gentle bird songs symphonies of buzzings and chirps down trails to fields where many flowers open to follow the sun's light where strangers pass with greetings of friendship and up to a colonnaded hilltop patio looking down over fields where workers who care about the land gather in the morning before beginning looking down at the zero waste factories at the several cars appearing, disappearing through trees noise, noiselessly on electromagnetic magic of rails in the fresh air of morning, the distant blue sea glass of the bay. His fever dream passing, the poet looks out louvered vinyl blinds where walkways crisscross a quad between buildings, pictures the graffitied plaza across the brick wall securing his campus from people paying out shrinking wages all the city's air hot thick over its built structures and traffic locked freeways and rubbing his eyes in the hazy blur sees a semester's horizon of unmarked papers oh that's great love that last line again too the the uh semester's horizon of unmarked papers uh, what is it do you think uh, since you write a lot of nature poems Stephen? What, what is it that draws you to nature poems um well i live on a barrier island in off the coast of georgia which is uh it's lush 
with uh, with vegetation. And so um, and I have a property of uh, a couple acres. It's in a suburb, um, but it's surrounded by uh, clumping bamboo of about 20 feet in height. And mm -hmm. so inside of my my little uh, protected area is is all kinds of trees, oak trees. Oh, wow. wow that sounds so nice. So really, yeah. you want to come to visit. Uh, yeah, sometimes. I want to visit. There. Right. So <laughs> I have, I have poems about my yard, uh, more than a few, uh -huh. and <laughs> about the the island in general. And uh, but it, it's the it's the nurturing, uh, you know, aspect of nature. I think in the in the modern world, which draws people, I think, to go on vacation in in you know, the in Colorado. And I've got a friend that went hiking in Colorado recently. Mm -hmm. Um, and he's got a book, he's got a book of poems, uh, also about nature. Uh, his name's Gordon Johnston. In fact, he did one of the blurbs for my book, but gotcha. well, very uh, cool. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. thanks so much for, for sharing that and for sharing a land of the optimistic poets. Stephen, that was great. Thank you. Yep. Take care. That was a Stephen Croft. Once again, a Mary Ann Abdo is next. Hey, Mary Ann. Unmute. Hi, how there are you? you? Yeah, great to see you. It's been a bit. Yeah, it's been a bit. A little busy promoting my book as well, too. Oh, congratulations. Well, feel free to tell us what it is. It's, I think I, I announced it, I think it was back in October. It's called Fracture Lollipop Poems or Brokenness. Oh, that's Hero. right. Mm -hmm. yeah. It was like, I sold 60 copies so far. Like, wow. <laughs> oh, that's great. It's about mental health. So I really liked your interview with Gayton. I can kind of like some of the poems in the book are obviously about healthcare, mm -hmm. and I can relate to his poem. That's really I wrote down Gemma. Oh yeah, Maybe I'll send some poetry to Gemma. That was <laughs> I think it's, I think we all should. Mm -hmm. There's actually a group on Facebook. I don't know if you're on Facebook. Uh, it's a rattle group called Trade Mag Takeover, which I had oh. I set up um, to try to have down. people share tips of places um, where they could. Sh you know, published in other magazines besides for poetry magazines. Right. Um, and, uh, and it just kind of, I don't know, it kind of withered away. I stopped promoting it and I forgot about it until looking at Gaten publishing in JAMA. And now. I thought, yeah, we should pick that up again. <laughs> <laughs> well, this one's based off, there's this automobile junkyard that just looks so lovely on 81 North and South. So this is called Whispering Junkyard Mountain. Hmm. Sunday morning anticipation Mount Margaret hiking adventure, a bucket list dream, driving past her magical scrapped metal loop towards the dirt road of no regrets, stepping out of Nissan and so my journey began. Oh, such wonderful shards of window glass caught my roving eye as tw rusted twisted metal lay upon my path of the unknown, turkey vultures snatching up junkyard rats just as the morning rain started, smells of fragrant oil permeated the air. Such a glorious early morning, water and oil mixing together, forming strange rainbow lipid pools. Noticing bare winter trees, capturing white plastic bags in their branches, small twisted plastic dot my trail, leading up to magnificent mountains of unrecognizable automobile parts. As for me, the adventurous hiker still searches for the elusive Mount Margaret. I must not waver for high noon is at hand, hiking past the glade surrounding rainbow pure water. Mount Margaret appeared in sight, armed with rope and heavy aluminum mesh hiking gloves, climbing up that rusty elevation one level at a time, making way with careful trepidation, reaching the crescendo of Mount Margaret's summit, an enthralling vision of turkey vultures circling as the afternoon sun is reflecting her glow, bouncing off glass and steel, creating illuminated orbs on the junk heap below. Oh, that was great. That was exactly kind of the kind of thing I had in mind when we uh, thought up this prompt <laughs> with yeah. um, really interesting descriptions of, um, of very human things. So that's really neat. Thanks for sharing. I that. loved it. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Whispering Junkyard Mountain. Love the title, too. Thanks for sharing that, Marianne. You're welcome. Thank you. Yep. Take care. It's a Marianne Abdo. Once again, uh, Brian O'Sullivan is next. Hey, Brian. 
Hello. Hey, great to see you. Very good to be here. Thanks. So uh, what do we have from Brian this week? Okay. So I sent a document that had two hyphen in it. I think I'm going to read the second one. It's called um, It's called Top of the World. Top of the World. Let me... Uh, hmm. One second, Brian. Let me pull it up. Yeah. Good time. Well, I'm excited to hear it's a high bin, as you know. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not seeing it, Brian. You want to try sending it again? We'll swing back to you because I want to be able to. Oh, sure. Sorry about that. Yeah, I will. It's prompt lines at rattle.com. Maybe I sent it. Yeah, yeah okay. I might... one, but yeah. yeah, maybe. Okay. okay Actually, sorry about that. I'll log into the old one really quick. I should I should keep that in just in case. Um, let's see. Uh, nope, not there either. So send it on in and we'll swing back to you. Okay, Brian? Okay. That was Brian O'Sullivan. We'll swing back to him. Let's go instead to Mike Bales. It's good night tonight. Hey, um, Mike. Yeah, great to see you. I like Mary Ann's thing. There's a junkyard kind of by Moline. Mm -hmm. There are all kinds of trees against by ponds in the junkyard. It's kind of weird mixture <laughs> of, na of nature and junk. I think one time I almost wanted to, except I don't get up early, uh, <laughs> grab some grab some camera and just take pictures of sunrise around there. Be kind of weird studying. Um, yeah, I tried nice. to email it to you and I couldn't, but it's unsubmittable. Yeah, I have it here. The I couldn't Schooner. access. I couldn't access the file, hmm. even though I'd been working on it earlier. Revising well, one of those days, it. I think maybe the planets are weirdly <laughs> aligned or something. My lap. <laughs> My laptop's a little finicky. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's the jungle. It's about actually a call center where surveys were done uh, from a from a, that call center. Oh, it's okay. called the jungle. <laughs> Cubicles crowd a spread of worn carpet where people find their places. It's do or die here. Clients hunger for responses to phone surveys. It's either it's either or be eaten. The best interviews get the interviewers get the lion's share. Plastic purple flowers in a corner office take in the sun as a manager reprimands someone. In the break room, I gaze out a plate glass window. In the corner of my eye, I see the world turn. The sun to the west burnishes sky and casts shadows, while a grove of trees nestled in a web of tree in a web of thoroughfares looks so real. Oh, that was great. That was The Jungle um, by uh, Mike Bales. D did you work in a call center, Mike? Um, I spent my claim to fame as being a flagger, but I spent 12 years total working in different call centers. Oh, I didn't know that. This, mm -hmm. for doing surveys, eight years till I kind of burned out and it wasn't working out anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and in other different settings, too. Yeah, well, definitely more the, the flagger job is more poetic because there are a lot of poems that come out of that, not the call center as much, but it's cool to, to get a uh, nature poem out of it. Thanks, <laughs> thanks, Mike. Okay, thanks. Yep, take care. There's a Mike Bales with The Jungle. And I'll see. Let's go uh, next to Dick Westheimer. Hey, all. Hey, Hi. Dick. Yeah, great to see you. With your high-tech camera. You I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's like he's right there. <laughs> I know. It's really, it's amazing. Yeah, it really is. But anyway, yeah, I, I, wrote, I, wrote, I wrote you a note about it. You won't be happy. Yeah, I know. Uh, I read the note. I wasn't happy. I haven't happy. seen the note yet. <laughs> <laughs> it is not something that we can really do, but okay. that's okay. <laughs> yeah. We'll try to approximate the quality of your video. Next. Yeah, I, have some, I have some other ideas, but uh, that, yeah. that one won't work for you. Okay. Well, you um, have your poems, Dick, and I can be well, I, um, <laughs> you know, I'm not sure what a nature poem is, That's right? You know, I didn't really know either. Um, you know, people talk about nature poetry, um, but but what does that really mean? You know, isn't it all nature? I don't know. I get kind of caught up in categories sometimes. <laughs> not, none of them really make sense, <laughs> you know? Well, you know, I, I figure, are they, are they poems where natural images are the triggering images? Are they the ones where natural images come in as, as you know, metaphors in it? it it's sort of a complicated. So I tried to write a poem without any naturally occurring hmm. things in it, but sort of after mm -hmm. the way poem that had natural images might be so i, I we'll see yeah, we'll see it. interesting yeah let's hear it. okay um in the hardware department of the reading road sears and roebuck summer 1970 
The ratches and wrenches gleamed like rodeo rhinestones. The drill presses all in a row hulked over us with their bucking bull heads. Down the aisle to the left, the plug-in wonders, the circular saws and their gleaming midway barker teeth, the power drills and their freak show noses, and Holly and me so stoned we had no place to go, but there where each screwdriver quivered with promise, the chisels and chain cutters spoke to us in koans, the pliers and pipe wrenches, as was their wont, hung, close-jawed, and stoic. Today, in 2023, at Home Depot, the tools don't talk. They cower like beasts behind cages, bound at the neck with cables and locks. The brands are candy-coated confections, DeWalt yellow, cobalt blue, Ryobi green, each a seducer whispering, pick me, pick me. So Holly and I text and agree. We'll meet up on Amazon.com to buy each other memories and check the box for next day delivered. <laughs> that was really oh, fun. Yeah, great. that was. Thanks so much for sharing that, Dick. I loved it. The, the details are just wonderful. And exactly another, another kind of poem I was hoping to get. So yeah, I wouldn't got. have thought there wasn't an allusion to nature in it if you hadn't told me you know, beforehand because you, we really brought it to life. We were in like the rent a center in a Home Depot not that long ago, and I was fascinated by it. So I love that poem. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, well, Walking through a forest. Yeah. <laughs> and how do you? How do you? Yeah. With, without without. I don't know. I don't know if that was the prompt, but I tried. Well, to I do don't it. know either. The, the thing I was thinking about too in the haiku world, there's a, they call them like haiku and then bench haiku. Do you remember oh, me talking yeah, about that? Right. Yeah. Where it's if you're actually in nature, it's mm -hmm. a nature haiku, yeah. and if you're imagining or remembering it, it's a bench haiku, which is somehow <laughs> to some people inferior. So maybe that's what they mean by a nature poem that it's like right while walking through. I don't know, but. Hopefully you wrote this in the uh, Home Depot. <laughs> <laughs> well, in my head. <laughs> on Amazon.com. We'll talk about it. Well, there you go. Well, thanks for sharing that, Dick. A lot of fun. Yeah, bye. Yep, take care. Bye. It was Dick Westheimer again with uh, In the Hardware Department of the Reading Road, Sears and Roebuck, Summer 1970. That great title, too. Uh, and now we have Brian's The Sullivan's Poem. And let's go back to Brian. Hey, Brian. Oh, you got it. Uh, there you go. Hey, Brian. Sorry about that. I think my... Brain is fried from all the final grading of the semester that I did this I know. This morning, I, I forget so. that the teachers are having it rough right now. Yeah, they are. <laughs> <laughs> we had a few people saying, you know, I'll get back to you after the this you know this week is over because this is hell week. Right. I think so and said so. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's the other side of it is that I'm really happy now the grading is done. So everything's good. <laughs> that's great. Oh, and I see you have a hyphen for us. I do. I'm going to do the second one in that document. Uh huh. Um, it's called uh, the top of the world. Okay. I tried to hide, but, um, but the second one is the top of the world, kind of seasonal. In the back of my parents' closet, a hatch opened into a corner of the North Pole, just like, according to mom, a hatch on the side of the furnace in the basement served as Santa's exit from the chimney. We didn't have a fireplace, but we may do, and apparently the red suit is fireproof. <laughs> Once a year, when I was old enough, I'd follow my grumbling dad up the shaky ladder to the dark, cold space where magic cardboard boxes lay half buried in snowy fiber. In my memory, those, there are rows and rows of those boxes, gleaming like no cardboard anywhere else. We haul the boxes down and start pulling the old newspaper pages. Kennedy assassinated, the Beatles split from the stars and baubles, the magi and barnyard animals, the lights and icicles, the wind-up music box with its tinny rendition of Silent Night. Decades later, I'm still unwrapping some of it. Crumbling King, head anchored in swizzle stick, <laughs> timeless. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I broke off many years ago. <laughs> we need a term for a visual haiku now. That was like a yeah, I felt like I the visual. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So, so describe for those uh, just listening what you held up there. <laughs> well, we, oh, it was just you know the boxes of the Christmas ornaments that we hold down every year. Mm -hmm. So it was just oh, what I held up. I'm sorry. Yeah, of course. <laughs> um, it is um, a kind of nice, I think. A uh, painted uh, Magi figure from the nativity set that my mom owned years and years ago uh, that I still have. 
Yeah, well, very cool. That's head broke off years ago, and now it's held on by a swizzle stick. Yeah, as Rob <laughs> Harris says, the prop is a nice touch, and it really was. I think we need more uh, props. Yeah, also. we see that was a real surprise when you busted out with that. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, felt like it needed it. <laughs> yeah. And very fun haiku too. I mean, I think uh, the hyphen, you know, it works so well when you f sort of forget you're reading a hyphen. Yeah. And all of a sudden, the you know the the, the haiku hits you. It's yeah. really nice. So good job, Brian. I mean, for both the walking part and the nature part, right? Like kind of travel poem thing, walking through nature. I don't know. Yeah. Well, excellent. Well, thanks so much for sharing that, Brian. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Take care. It's Brian O'Sullivan with uh, the top of the world. And uh, next we have uh, Laura Berg. Hey, Laura. How are you? Yeah, great to see you. This was really, this was really an adventure. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's the it, it it's the train you take in from the airport. Oh, um, mm -hmm. It's Era Air Bay. I tumbled toward the unforest of the city I've missed on the Era Air Bay through tunnels of graffiti, ziz faux and oblique rising above swirls of trash, bubble wrap, McDough, fast food scraps, Fanta cans, inserts of Le Monde, the giant rats scuttle underneath where the curve of the stadium meets raw pavement. And there's so much noise, this train's steel wheels are flawed, there are high winds, and an elderly couple rages merd and say she yawn as loudly as they can because they can't hear. And let's face it, French leads itself to talking about excrement. <laughs> and I'm not saying that all of this isn't beautiful, since in just a few more minutes, I'll be back in Paris. <laughs> Oh, that's great. I'm sorry for not being able to contain my laughter. <laughs> that line. Well, that's one of the things that you're here for is the laughter. Oh, good. Track. I'm good today. That was a great line. I love that. That was. Yeah, so many fun poems today, and that was no exception. Thanks so much for sharing that, Laura. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, that line about the, the French is going to be great. Although, we'll probably get some, some angry emails from French speakers. I feel like I'm going to be saying that sometime. I'm going to be having to quote this poem, I think. <laughs> yeah, well, that was great. As always, thanks so much, Laura. That was Laura Berg with a uh, R-E-R-B. Um, and next we have, uh, uh, let's go to um, Rob Harris. Hi, how are hey, you? Hey, Rob, yeah, good to see you. Good to see you, thank you. Um, I, uh, when I learned of this week's prompt, I had just uh, come back from a, a visit to the gym, and so that kind of inspired what I was writing. And as I did it, I wasn't so much thinking of a nature poem as more of like a, a TV show on maybe like Discovery or some <laughs> like Wild West, it's some sort of nature TV show. I, I heard a very British kind of uh, intellectual kind of dull voice, learn, very learned um, as I was writing this. So um, this is, it's kind of informed. I wasn't, I didn't have a poet poem in mind necessarily. Uh, well, that's great. It sounds like the perfect setup, having a voice in your head right away. is yeah. great. I, great way I, to start just, a poem. I just I can, what I the voice it. said. Yeah. This is what came out. It's, it's uh, I call it Encounter at the Gymnasium. I'm going to try to maybe lower, or try to get the voice I was trying to get. <laughs> okay, let's we'll see um, if, you're, if you're up for some voiceover work later. Here goes. I haven't practiced this. This is the first <laughs> Here we go. Round metallic plates of various sizes, 10 pounds, 25 pounds, and the ferocious 45 pounder sit patiently upon their perch, awaiting the next human encounter, where they will be gathered up, always in equal pairs, and set up into place upon a heavy iron bar. The human who has put them into place then lays down upon his back, upon a cushioned platform, and pauses for a moment, presumably in order to gather up his thoughts. A smell of physical exertion hangs in the air, propelling the human forward in this resolute quest to achieve definition. The bar is then lowered and raised up again. The human completes a series of these motions, which are known to him as reps. Following a short pause to rearrange his grip upon the bar, the human conducts yet another series of these bizarre upward motions. The now depleted human, as yet unwilling to abandon his objective, takes a series of deep breaths before carrying his ritual to its conclusion through a final series of strained exertions. <laughs> With his objective now completed, the human arises from his platform, takes a drink of water from his portable supply, 
and restores the metal plates to their previous perch, where they will resume their silent vigil awaiting the next human who may happen to come along. <laughs> That's great. There's such fun poems tonight. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that, Ron. I could definitely hear that narrator That's you've so read. That's funny. Too. Yeah. <laughs> I just I, I heard the the ferocious forty five pounder and I said I, I got to keep doing this. <laughs> yeah, just, that's uh, true. Excellent. Yeah, thanks so much for sharing. That, Rob. Thank you for listening to it. Yep. I appreciate it. It was Rob Harris with Encounter at the Gymnasium. <laughs> uh, let's go to uh, Mary Keating next. Hey, Mary, are you there? Hmm. We'll swing back to Mary. Oh, there she I'm is. Here. Hey, Mary. Yeah, yeah good to see you. Um, unfortunately, I can't turn my video on because I got in a car accident, so they crashed into me and on my back. Oh, I'm sorry to hear about sorry. that. Yeah, well, I'm so glad you could join us anyway, though. But yeah, definitely sorry to hear about that. So I'll try and read a poem. But everybody's poem is so cheerful and mine's not. Well, that's okay. It's great for the contrast and for the yeah. mix. And yeah, definitely. So let's hear this one. So this is called Hospital Visitation. I'm not thrilled about the title, but I'll probably come up with a different one. Okay. Sun streams through the lobby's four-story glass walls, cooling onto the terrazzo like a waterfall, listing the surface like the granite floor of a shallow pool. For a brief moment, the play of light upon primordial elements soothes me, reminds me of our origins. I take the elevator to the 11th floor, Oops, sorry. rising to the heights of rising to heights of a reinforced canopy, but there are no trees here, and oxygen only dwells in cold, cylindric canisters. Rooms flank each side of the hallway. Patients are attended to like queen bees, but no sticky sweetness fills their cells. I enter where you are wrapped in a cocoon of white blankets, tubes like vines crawling out your trunk and branches where there should be honey, suckles celebrating your richness. A steady hum of machines measures your life force as nutrients strip down plastic arteries into your body. And though you are in pain, you offer me a quarter moon smile. You lie like pupa waiting for wings to carry you to the other side, to flit from one joy to the next. Unlike here, where MS robbed you of your freedom, eroding myelin like the Colorado, with such a slow pace, we were lulled into hoping your life would never end until now when the canyon of death looms before us until we're dwarfed by its unre unrelenting sheer power, unable to wield unfathomable emptiness. I close my eyes, will your cocoon into a butterfly's chrysalis, a reminder of how precious, beautiful, fleeting life on earth is as I confront the end of yours. The beginning of two waterfalls weep from my eyes, brimming with a pain I cannot bear alone. Oh, very moving poem. Thanks so much for sharing that, Mary. Um, and a you know, perfect poem for today with um, with Gaten as the the guest too. Um, but but really, I hope you know hope the recovery goes well and, yeah. and you feel better soon. Uh, well, but, well, that's not about me. That's about someone I love who's at his end of life and it's very sad. Yeah. So I thought poetry is very therapeutic. Mm -hmm. Like. About it. But sorry to be a bummer for No, everybody. it's no, no such thing. Definitely. I mean, poetry is about every aspect of life, and that's an important one uh, for, in a lot of ways. So yeah. thanks so much for sharing that. Okay, thanks. Yep, take care. As a Mary Keating with Hospital Visitation. Um, and next, let's go to Nate Jacob. Hello, Nate. Hello. Yeah, good to see you. Good to see you, too. Hey, I uh, I kind of went the same direction as Dick with a uh, retail. Ah. <laughs> uh, I actually worked for Target for 13 years. Oh, uh, you know, somehow I could see it. It's like totally your favorite Target employee. In red and khaki. Yeah, yeah. I see it. <laughs> Haven't worn red since. <laughs> <laughs> so I, uh, yeah, we got some uh, Christmas at Target here. Uh, <laughs> I don't. <laughs> Target's winter wonderland reeks of a pine saw spill on aisle 47. <laughs> See how the life so abundant here has already accepted you as one of their own, though they prefer you stay clear and meek and well out of their way. Hark how the front left wheel of every cart joins the chirp of retail angels and birds, 
while each winter fattened gatherer delights in the shimmer and glow of snow that's not exactly snow, of trees and that other trees can hardly look upon, <laughs> and of promises yearly and dearly of peace, peace on earth, goodwill to all, and all that. A quiet observer, still, so still, so very still, will see that that the winter dark approaches in the outsider's barren landscape. Here in Target's 3.5 acre preserve, there is life <laughs> enough. There is warmth enough for the world. And so they come. The annual return of the holiday birds, cards and beaks and cash on wing, ready to line their faux feathered nests with the lowest prices of the year to come. Maybe you came for the string lights. You will leave without them, sold out since just after sunset in October. And the birds around you pity you, sing mournfully of your mostly empty cart in this, the season of mad gathering. <laughs> That was so fun. A little bit of a low blow for Katie, who we went to Target to try to find Christmas lights like November 30th. Yeah, maybe. like the, the literally the worst day to do that. That was the day when yeah, I had like was... four options. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anyway, that's great. I love that Target as a 3.5 acre preserve. Yeah. Like... Gotcha. On a related note, I have a rainbow light lit tree, which is fun, but not what I intended to purchase. It's nice, though. I've got yeah. one, too. Yeah. yeah. A lot of fun, Nate, as always. Thanks for sharing. Thanks that. a lot. Yep, take care. So Nate Jacob with uh, Target's Winter Wonderland reeks of a pine sauce spill <laughs> on aisle A47. All right. Well, that was fun. <laughs> Let's see what a David Cook's got. David hasn't been here in a while. Hey, David, are you there? Mm, Hello. Yes. I don't see you, but I hear you. Yes, I am. I'm here. I just have to. There ah, we go. There you go. Yeah, it's been Alrighty. a bit for you, too. Yeah, how you been? I've been good. I've been working all summer on uh, a Japanese style garden, half oh. acre in Tualatin. Oh, wow. And that's wow. what's kind of like uh, occupied all my time. So I haven't been doing the poetry thing. Oh, well, I'm so glad. So. Yeah, I'm so glad you're back. And, and that sounds, it gets, bring pictures next time. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, also, just to go back to the, um, the inability to wear uh, red and khaki. Uh, from Target, I can no longer be, uh, wear uh, blue cardigan sweaters from my 12 years of Catholic school. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, the uh, the garden, the, the poem that I sent is, it's about a garden, and you usually think of gardens as nature, but I uh, learned, definitely learned this summer that uh, it's a lot of man-made mm -hmm. uh, construction behind it. Yeah, interesting. Well, let's hear it. And this is, uh, this is uh, a poem I wrote about the Lansu Garden, Chinese Gardens, which is a city block right in the middle of uh, downtown Portland. Ah. Uh, so there's traffic going around it. And, um, and so it's a little bit of a sanctuary right in the middle of town. The scent of stones and water. Hear the fragrance of this garden. Outside, a stringent bellow of diesel. A loam thumb of a loam thrum of tread and caster, sound as stones I'd swim among, sunk by the humble ministrations for his children's children's playground. There his little ones imagine the view from those doll house mountains, tatting of moss and a scent of pinion wafting from cracked quilts of icy blossoms, remnant scent of their granny, her patchwork sewing. Her bay tree growing by her stoop prompts her joking. Oh my, that does smell loud. Oh, that's great. <laughs> Love it. Great ending to all these yeah. poems. Man. That was wonderful. And are you having the Japanese too with below? Um, I do have the Chinese below on that one, but that's uh, that translation has, hasn't has been revised as much as the poem. Uh -huh. And um, I've been told it sounds kind of like a, a small child uh repeating things over and over again well um, it's wonderful that they can do that though it's really cool yeah. i'm always jealous of people speaking yeah. jealous if we can speak other languages <laughs> very cool for for sharing that. i love the uh the, the american sonnet too another one. Oh, nice catch yeah, yeah. <laughs> and yeah the, the first i played with a lot of the rhyme and internal rhyme and uh and a lot of um 
a lot of ambiguity as far as the words like pinyin mm -hmm. is actually uh spelled like the chinese language uh the romanization of the chinese language Oh, interesting. um hmm. and um it's one letter off from the tree Oh, yeah. um I just so thought there's... it was the tree because I'm a horrible speller. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what I thought originally, too. So I, but, I, you know, I roll with the mistakes. Yeah. And <laughs> if you repeat them three times, according to the Thelonious Monk, they become your style. <laughs> yeah, I love that quote. Thanks so much for sharing that. And great to see you, David. Good to, good to have you after. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Also, one thing I wanted to clear up about the uh, po um, you had a poet that was uh, published in The Poetry Box. Uh -huh. Yeah. That's a that's actually a Portland publishing company. Ah, mm -hmm. uh, Sean Avingo uh -huh. uh, runs it. And, yeah, yeah, uh, we have a lot of. Uh, I'm not sure if we published Sean or um, or has been on before. It's a name that's really familiar, and I yeah, yeah. remember that. Yeah. So that's different from my my business of the uh, poetryboxes.com dot com, gotcha. where I build poetry boxes. Yeah, that's the thing. I was conflating. Oh. Yeah, I, I I saw that in your eyes. I was like, oh, he's <laughs> thinking the two things at the same time. Yeah, and then you were here today. I mean, what are the odds though? I think I could have sensed it maybe or something. But I'm glad glad you're back. I I so wanted to be here for the uh, Bob Hickok mm -hmm. one, but I just missed it. Yeah. Well, it's great to see you now, and I'm glad you're taking a break from the garden now that the weather doesn't let you. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Right. Have a great night. Okay. Take care. You too. And that was a David Cook, um, familiar face from past Rattlecast, but hasn't been on about a year, I guess. Let's go uh, next to Donna Kay, who is a first-time caller, I believe. Hey, Donna. Are you there? Well, yikes. Hello. <laughs> Oh, I think uh, you got unmute again. I think you were muted, unmuted for a second. Yeah. Okay. Hey, hello. This is so exciting. Oh, my God. <laughs> well, I'm so I glad to have you here. <laughs> I am I'm just retired as a nurse, mm -hmm. and I'm starting to um, get into poetry, and I loved the um, – so I'm so glad to, that I came for tonight. And I'm so glad I stayed on because I thought you had – I have a subscription. Uh-huh. And – I thought you had to uh, put something in in advance. I'm just learning about Rattle. Oh, okay. Great. Yeah, well, thanks so much. Yeah, so how it usually works, these are prompt lines. So we have a prompt every every month, or every week, I should say. I don't know why I said month. <laughs> every week we have a prompt. So we have poems sort of in, you know, written after that prompt. But I, I saw you say you had something um, that related to the guest, I think. I, I saw on the chat window you mentioned that. Is there something you want to share, a poem, or are you just sure. saying hi? I mean, poem. And I thought since it was a little medically, um, it wouldn't shock people. The title is called Placenta. Okay. And did you email it to me or no? It didn't. Okay. Well, we'll do it regular way the next time, but we'll let it all slide because I want to hear this poem because I heard you <laughs> mention it. So let's go okay. ahead and just hear it. We'll watch you read. And then, okay, Placenta. A living organ attached. I'm sorry. <laughs> let's just start over. I'm so excited. <laughs> Placenta. All living beings were attached at the time of birth. The cord that supplied the living nutrients was severed. The baby cried out and began a separate life from the mother. The, the process of separation began with the first breath. Yet the attachment bond and the emotional bond was not severed. It was so strong throughout childhood and young adulthood. Hands-on help, bathing, cooking. Now I have adult children. They do not need me. How can I accept that they want our relationship to be on their terms, not my terms? I want more. I want to see them more often. I want to have a meal together, take a walk together. We, at one time, lived by yellow post-it notes. They were always attached to the kitchen countertop. I always knew where they were, who they were with, what they ate for dinner, what they were reading. I miss them. I miss the attachment, the placenta, the cord was cut. Oh, that's beautiful Aww. and so relevant to today's show. Thanks so much for sharing. That was Donna Carpenter with Placenta, and great to see you and have you on. Yeah, I'll be back. This was awesome. <laughs> okay, cool. Great. Yeah, so we'll have a prompt for next week and then write a poem this week about that. And that's the, the prompt lines. That's what we do. 
So uh, okay. sit tight for the prompt in a little bit, and then uh, we'll see what you come up with next week, Donna. Okay. Okay, great. Take care. It was Donna Carpenter once again with Placenta. Nice having first-time enthusiastic callers here. Mm -hmm. Let's go next to Monica Dobos. Hello, hello. Hey, Monica. Hi. Yeah, good to see you. Um, so two things. I am so I was so psyched about Gaetan's initiative to introduce like poetry in hospitals. I think mm -hmm. that's that's really amazing. Um, and secondly, that ties into my poem. Um, I've been recently listening to Marisa Peer, who's like this uh, hypnotherapist. She's a therapist, and she hmm. talks about anxiety. And randomly, in her video, she mentions like how kissing actually lowers your anxiety because of the amount of saliva <laughs> that's emitted in your mouth. <laughs> oh, that's really interesting. Um, hmm. And so that that's kind of what started my poem. And of course, I had to pay attention to the prompt too. <laughs> um how Bugs Bunny got into it, I don't know. But <laughs> there it is. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm excited for this one. Sounds fun. <laughs> okay. Because kissing lowers your anxiety levels by making your mouth water, Bugs Bunny moves <laughs> into his fridge for a day. Three pairs of socks, two underwear, belly button silk cap, aviator cap, ear socks, mittens, whisker insulators, storage jar. I'm all set. Now, I don't have a sweetheart per se, but I read in Cut and Tail Scientific that cold enhances saliva production. So here I am in the fridge for a day, stacking up on drool, investing futures in my anxiety coping skills, saving on therapy bills. I take off my ski goggles and graze Leslie Lettuce, peck Peter Parsley. <laughs> I, read the, I read the ingredients on the Thousand Islands, my favorite dressing in the world. I give a smacker on crispy celery and a thumb on the compressor for being too loud at work. I wrap my muffler tighter around the merino wool turtleneck and smooch ruby rutabaga. She slaps me. I don't know if she wants more or if she's just displeased. I play with my ears and flutter my eyes, but she turns around chatting up wheelie wilted turnip. It's not my first rejection, so I don't despair. I grab two carrots by the hair and snog Claire, the super coiffed broccoli. <laughs> She's a long tonguer. I choke. I want to reach for eyes but can't feel my fingers, then realize I can wiggle my nose. I take a look at my watch. It's only 10 a.m. Storage jar, half full. Time to get the hell out of here till my bum is still alive. I open the fridge door when I hear Ruby Rutabaga sigh. Come back soon. <laughs> <laughs> that's a really fun poem. Wow. Thanks so much for sharing that. I love your titles, especially. Oh, it's so creative. <laughs> yeah. I love it. Wow. <laughs> yeah, thanks for sharing that. All so right. many fun Thank poems today. Thanks, me. Monica. Yep. Take care. So, Monica Dobos with uh, Because Kissing Lowers Your Anxiety <laughs> Levels by Making Your Mouth Water, Bugs Bunny Moves into <laughs> His Fridge for a Day. <laughs> Yeah, that was that was really interesting. You know, you are a great partner to have as a co-host here and funny poems like the <laughs> <laughs> I really think I could have just been hitting the laugh button with all these. Could, like every well. single poem has an amazing title too. Yeah, the like, titles wow, are really great. Really good. I gotta up my game on my titles. Definitely. Yeah, me too. <laughs> all right, let's go to Brent Stoffer next. Hello. Hey Brent, yeah, great to see you. Hey, good to see you guys. Yeah, it's it's been um it's been a really cool night. I, um, I, I've, I've, I've read a lot or I see a lot of, uh, uh, of poetry that, uh, bridges the gap between arts and science, uh -huh. but not so much the medicine thing. I think that's really cool. Yeah. There really aren't exciting. as many. I mean, I, we had, uh, Rachel Malalu mm -hmm. and then, um, there are a couple other people who, if I thought really hard, I could remember their names. But there's not a whole, a whole lot of uh, <laughs> Dr. Poets, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's really, really cool, really inspiring. So but, what do you uh, got for us? Yeah. Okay, well, I got a, a, a prompt poem. Um, it uh, It's not super fun, but it's kind of fun until the end. <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> and... Um, uh the um the title is is uh it it's 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 not a showstopper 
But it tells you uh, what's happening in the poem, so that's good. Well, that's enough of the preamble. <laughs> okay, let's all right. Here, Brett. Let the poem speak all for right. itself. All right, I'll shut up and read. Um, roaming through the music room, the semicircular rows of empty chairs radiate from the podium like ripples from a stone thrown into a placid pond. I drift through them oarless and content. With the other students gone, silence gathers and settles throughout the room like burgeoning dusk. Abandoned timpani accrue shadows as boulders on a twilight seashore. I sit before a sleeping grand piano, open its long glistening mouth and examine the many teeth. A harp case hulks darkly half open, the black moss inside shining, the entrance to a deep and magical cave. Before long, my father, the instructor, will open the door and the world will flood this place with headlights and car horns. Only the unbeaten drums know how lonely that will make me. Oh, that's another great last line. Thanks for sharing that. I Brett. love the opening simile too. The number of times that I have seen semicircular rows around a podium having a <laughs> chorus and love, yeah. loving going to see live music. I've never thought of them that way. And I feel like the next time I will definitely think of this poem, Brett. Oh, cool. That's awesome. Thanks, guys. Yeah, thanks, Brett. Appreciate it. Good pro- it, was a, it was a fun prompt. Yeah, and an excellent segue too to say that I announced our next uh, theme. Speaking of like professions. And uh, poetry and, and how they combine, you know, not medicine, but music. We're having a tribute to musicians coming up next. Uh, yeah, so we'll see how music inspires people's poems uh, with that. So good good excuse to oh. mention that. Thanks thanks for that, too. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. I look, I look forward to that. I look forward to next week. Yeah, see you all cool. soon. Thanks. thanks. Yep, Bye. thanks, Brent. It was Brent Stauffer Bye-bye. with uh, Roaming Through the Music Room. And uh, Bishwajit Mishra is next up. Hey, Bishwajit. Hey, Tim and hey, Katie, yeah, good, good, to see good you. evening, Hi. how are you? Hey. We're great. <laughs> okay, I submitted my poem. Uh, oh. Do you have it up? Yeah, I will pull it up as you uh, explain <laughs> what you're writing about. <laughs> uh, it, uh, I think it's, a, it's an unnatural environment <laughs> that I really physically waded through <laughs> and I tried to... <laughs> Make it a nature poem. <laughs> I don't know how far I succeeded. <laughs> <laughs> well, that sounds fun. It's a, uh, at 61? Yeah. Okay. Okay. At 61, I crossed the 60th. But that was the first time. But I'm going to talk about the second time when I crossed it again at 62, the 60th. But it might have been just a wee bit north of that at the town named after a lake but I ran into a forest of names, rising like tall pines, creeping like the vines on trellis, some of, some with the girth of hundred-year-old oaks. Actually, some of them might nearly be. I meandered through them between the alleys and orchard, but of different kinds of trees, and one our tractor left like a woolly mammoth. That's where I was headed, actually. I mean, Uli was a few years ahead of me, but unbeknownst to me, there was a statue of Uli I would see later. But getting back to the forest and no visible water, though the town bears the name of a lake, which I wouldn't finally see, but back to our forest, there were flowers, some as bright as tulips out of snow, some large and bright again as sunflowers, and those were fruits, definitely, of labor of many and years and years of it, but like any orchard or garden, I mean, at unlikely places, one bored fellow starts, and he did here too, just a little north of the 60th parallel, the latitude, and started a pile of signs. Yes, every garden is a kind of sign of the gone gardener, and every tree is a bone, but better because it breathes. Oh, that's great. And then there's a note that says, um, this is about the signpost forest in the town of Watson Lake, Yukon. Um, yeah, that's really wonderful. I love that. I've never, uh, I want to look up pictures of that after the show. No, I, I, I thought I sent the picture. I forgot. I had it. I, I posted it on the Facebook group. Ah. 
I forgot. I thought I sent it. Well, that's excellent. Uh, so good time to let everybody know. If you're on Facebook, you can join our uh, prompt Rattlecast. What is the prompt? Prompt lines. Prompt lines. I think. Prompt lines. Yeah. <laughs> you should really know so, the name of our group. We should. And I can't look right now. It is a, it's streaming. Yeah, there was one army guy when the gold rush happened. I think they were building this um, uh, Alaska highway. And he was bored. I think he just, he was homesick. He put his one license plate there. And then people added. And now oh, they wow. have like more than 100,000. Oh, my gosh. Well, wow. that is a two, I have two stops of the road trip. I'm going to go to Portland wow. to see the huge, garden in the middle of the city. And then thing. on the way to the signpost forest. Let's do it. <laughs> Let's I, do I, it. Can, I, can, I can email you uh, that thing. Uh, you can show it before the show ends if okay, you yeah, want. Yeah, email it to me. We'll <laughs> yeah, thanks. Miss, miss. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank it was you. Mishra. Once again, with them at 61, I crossed the 60th. Thanks, Bridget. Thank you. Okay. Bye -bye. And then uh, let's see. Who do we have? That wraps it up for the show. Let's see. Um, yeah, someone's, yeah, let's just let's just call it a night. So thanks, everybody, for, uh, for joining on the Zoom. That's going to run through the poems for today. Um, well, now let me read uh, Ted Guevara's poem. Um, and uh, let's do Ted's. So Ted has this interesting picture. You always come up with something interesting with Ted's poems. He includes this photograph, which I am now forced to describe. <laughs> and um, for those uh, only listening. And uh, the poem is, it's sort of like columns and like, maybe like some kind of guy standing and it like melts. Columns and the negative space between the columns is like a single guy that's repeated as a pattern throughout. Okay, there is you that go. All right? Should, that was was it all right? Was it fair to interrupt? That's a good description. You <laughs> okay. did a better job than me. Okay. So that's what we're looking at. And then here we're going to take a look at the poem by Ted. Pondland. So there you go. So those are, I guess, were pawns they, they were kind like of looking at. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> Pondland. Tongues need the fresh air, not just the noses. For our taste buds are departmentalized in such a small place. Elon's tongue has the same virtue. It bought the air at such a high tag the air had to give up an O. Now it's left with one. Who can enunciate with just one? A liberated nostril? One who votes Green Party just to piss off the neighbor who <laughs> happens to be happy being a stiff from day to day. Goes to church, works at 4 a.m., eats his meal nuked from the countertop. He only cooks the Angus. <laughs> <laughs> but he has a tongue possessed by winged Diablos. Happy he is, he's got Roseanne now, giving fashion tips. Ah, but he goes for Queenie, a cul-de-sac over. He thinks he can swoon her together with her Maserati. How grand is life! When our tongues swirl freely from the best mouthwash available. <laughs> How commensurating. Uh, you can say that again. How commencing. You can say that again. How menstruating. <laughs> you can say that again. It's another fun poem. And po on that prompt poems group, Ted mentioned that he has not missed writing a prompt poem in like years. Since 2021. I am amazed. That is the highest <laughs> accolade you could get from me personally. I think that was amazing. Yeah, that's really cool. And of course, Ted can't join the Zoom. So we're always happy to share his poems. He's mm -hmm. always watching. Thanks, Ted, for sharing that poem with us. So um, let's go to the uh, Saiku. Let's see. Since you're right here, we'll do the Saiku first. Okay, great. And then we'll do, uh, and then we'll do the next week's prompt. Okay. So the Saiku for this week is based on this story, which I think um, Gaten Scrow would find interesting too. Um, what happens in the brain while daydreaming? Um, and this was a study uh, out of the Harvard University, and they were looking at mouse brains. And uh, they were showing mice these images. Um, and you can see, I think, down here on the screen, these sort of um, checkerboard chess kind of images mm -hmm. um, and moving and then monitoring the way that the neurons, which neurons lit up. They would show them these images, then give them a big, big break and then watch their neurons and see what they were doing. And they found out that the mice were sort of daydreaming about these images and shapes in their downtime. Mm. And based on how the, the sort of the patterns of the neural firing, it was like teaching them to sort of remember better like like sort of um with less coding kind of if you if that makes kind of sense they were sort of changing the way they thought about encountering these new weird shape objects that you don't see in nature speaking of nature <laughs> um so anyway so they're kind of like you know fixing their memory of these things that they saw while daydreaming they're just little mice you know so that's pretty <laughs> cool so anyway that was the research um and of course humans do the same thing we daydream all the time so this was the uh little haiku based on that a uh, one uh, a one-liner, fixing typos while daydreaming. 
<laughs> yeah. That's great. Fixing typos <laughs> while daydreaming. That is your side coup for this week, and that is the show for uh, this week. And let's talk about next week. Uh, we are going to have a um, a uh, prompt. Do you want to read the prompt? No, sorry, sorry I was right distracted. Now. I really like that moniker. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> okay. So this is the prompt for next week. Katie, take it away. Okay, we are going to be we're going to write a poem that includes multiple lists. Yeah, you might have noticed that uh, Gaten had uh, several lists within his poems, and one of the poems had like multiple lists. So he would like do right. a list, then like go off on a tangent, go back to a yeah. different list. Yeah, he's a poet that likes lists. And I, so... I'm also trying to bait Santa Claus into <laughs> reading <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So... He's, he writes lists. Why can't he write multiple lists and put it in a poem? Yeah, and if you if you make a list and then check it twice, but mm-hmm. then make a second list, it would qualify. <laughs> right. for the prompt right. So um, so that's the prompt for this week. Um, be like Santa and write a poem that includes <laughs> multiple lists. Um, and so really open-ended, uh, just a, a structural type of uh, prompt this week. Yeah, definitely. It's uh, wanting uh, going one level above your average list poem, I would say. I've exactly. never written a poem. I think that has multiple lists, so I'm excited. Yeah, me neither. I've never even yeah. heard of it or thought yeah. of it. So, <laughs> yeah. So anyway, that's going to be your prompt for this week. Uh, next week's guest in the Rattlecast is going to be Deborah Marquardt. And Deborah appeared, and it's interesting we have this uh, issue number 28 background in the cover here, because it's got the uh, medical, it was a tribute to nurses we had, which um, Donna Carpenter will be interested in to hear about. <laughs> that was issue number 28. Um, Deborah was a finalist for the Rattle Poetry Prize back in there, mm-hmm. and uh, her press sent me a copy of her new book, which is a new and selected. And every time you see a new, or new and collected, I should say, Gratitude with Dogs Under Stairs is the name of the book. <laughs> and if you see a new and collected poems, that's pretty cool. I wanted to have, have her on as a guest. So she's coming up on uh, next week's Rattlecast. We're moving up a day. So next Monday, of course, is Christmas. Um, you know, not everybody celebrates Christmas, but some people do. A lot of people do. So many people do that I couldn't find a guest who wanted to come on Christmas. <laughs> so should have asked Santa. I should have asked Santa. He's busy that <laughs> no, day. No, he's chilling. <laughs> Oh, that's true. <laughs> yeah, you know. <laughs> You're right. This is one day off. Well, maybe we should have. Anyway, uh, Deborah Marquardt's going to be the rest of the day after Christmas, Tuesday, Tuesday, December 26th, but the regular time, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific, will be taking uh, your list poems, uh, d- multiple list poems for the open lines. It'll be a lot of fun, so I hope to see you then. Hope you have a great holiday in the meantime and a great week, and I'll talk to you later. Good Thanks, night. Thanks, everybody. Bye.